Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to UNESCO session on the indicators of internet universality. Uh, we are waiting just for five minutes maximum to start. And uh, you are welcome to sit around the round table. Thank you. Welcome to
Good morning, everyone. My name is Dorothy Gordon. I am the chair of the Intergovernmental Council of UNESCO's Information for All program. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this session. Uh, our apologies for starting a little bit late. We realize there are a lot of people who are still stuck in the registration queue, but we have a lot of ground to cover today. So I'm reluctant to wait any longer. This is a very special session. Uh, for the first time, we will have gathered in one space um, the leaders, as we could say, in the implementation of the Internet Universality Indicators. Countries that have um, taken them on board and carried out the assessments, and some who are planning to do the implementation. And so I'm really looking forward to this as the chair of IFAP, because not only is IFAP grounded in the philosophy of the Rome X indicators, rights-based, open, access, multi-stakeholder, and um, David, apart from gender? Cross-cutting cross issues. Yes, the cross-cutting issues are gender and? Children. And the marginalized in society. Adults. All of these okay. are very important for IFAP. So we'll have the pleasure of hearing from stakeholders from 16 countries, if my count is correct. 16 countries which are in the process of starting the implementation. There will be many rich lessons to learn from this, and I am sure that my colleague, Xiang Hong, will be writing an excellent report that will actually help us to move forward on these important issues. But before we get into that, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Guillerme Canela, Advisor for Communication and Information at the UNESCO office in Montevideo for his opening and welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Good morning to you all. Uh, real welcome to you to this session, despite the cold weather. Uh, it's great to see early birds here. Um, I'm really, really very happy to see uh, this session going on. I was involved in the very beginning of the building of these Internet Universality Tools. As is explained in this book, we started this process more than six years ago uh, in Latin America. The first draft of the Internet Universality Indicators was produced in that region be just before Net Mundial with the support of NIC.br and LACNIC. Um, at that stage, we already knew it would be a very complex process, and we had doubts how successful this could be, precisely due to the complexity of this instrument and of what we wanted to achieve. But uh, right now, I'm glad to see, looking into the agenda you have today, that we can say already that the process was successful. And uh, I want to use my remaining two minutes and 30 seconds to tell you why we think this process was successful. First element, it was the ownership from our member states. From the very beginning, uh, we made consultations starting in the Net Mundial, involving uh, and listening to the different stakeholders, but particularly uh, the member states in this process. And you can see this here. We have vice ministers in the opening. We have several countries presenting first assessments. But more important than that, we have the endorsement of our general conference and the Council of the IPDC. 
but we also uh, engaged several stakeholders in this process. So in the 25 countries, UNESCO is already talking to, to apply the Internet Universality Indicators, and those countries are in different levels and stages of assessment. Uh, in all of them, multiple stakeholder sets of players are involved, civil society organizations, universities, as you'll see in cases in Latin America, even more than 10 universities were involved in the process of application. So this is also very interesting. And you, again, in the core, uh, if you see in, this, in the, the, the explaining of this session, you will see that the co-organizers of this very session are also a multi stakeholder set of players like the Global Forum for Media Development, uh, the Internet Society, uh, governments, and multilateral organizations. So this multi-stakeholder involvement, uh, for sure, is the second element of success of this, of this tool. And finally, the third element, and most, most important of all, is the potential impact of the implementation of the Internet Universality Indicators. Talking with the governments in Latin America that are already applying uh, the, this tool, they are convinced this evidence-based way of doing policy towards the development of a rights-based, open, accessible, and most stakeholder government, governed the internet is the way forward, and that this tool that was developed, as I said, uh, starting six years ago, is an excellent input for this sort of evidence-based policy. So I do hope that the challenges and good practices in, in applying the indicators that will be certainly presented today. It will be um, a, an interesting element for those that will need to still apply the indicators and for those that have already finished. Uh, it will be an interesting insight for the next steps that are the implementation of the recommendations you have inserted in your reports. So let's work. A good day for all, for us, all of us. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Guillermo, and um, it's inspirational, I think, to hear of the whole process. And um, this is a good point, I believe, uh, for me to invite uh, my two colleagues, um, Xiang Hong and David, uh, Xiang Hong Hu and David Suter, uh, to give us a bit more background. Uh, Mr. Suter, has been quite instrumental in elaborating the indicator framework. Whereas Ms. Hu has been the driving force behind this coordination, uh, the coordination of this process, and um, really a great ambassador for the indicators, uh, both in HQ and globally. So please give us an overview. Thank you so much, Dorothy. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming early to this session. And this uh, very interesting uh, discussion, as my colleague already gave you a sense of it. It's really not a, a new one, but we have been here for six years, since 2013. We started to have this beautiful concept of internet universality since WISIS Plus 10 review early in 2013. I saw the uh, main theme of this year's IGF is one world, one net, and one vision. I believe the universality zone principle should be a part of this one shared vision about how we are going to shape this digital society. As you all know, these four principles are really short, crisp, simple, beautiful, but also complex. Human rights based, open, accessible, to all and uh, driven by the multi stakeholder participation. And uh, by giving teeth to these uh, um, four uh, broad principles, we have eventually developed 303 indicators. So you see the complexities in it. 
the process, um, well, it's not um, to creating a car indoor, but it's an open, inclusive process to collect uh, the wisdom from the global stakeholders, from uh, 2,000 experts from uh, all countries. That's exactly the success of the multi-stakeholder approach. I know even in the IG sphere, many people are skeptical. What do you mean by multi-stakeholder? It's something cosmetic. I don't buy that. Through this process, in past six years, we successfully tap in the wisdom from everyone and to find out a common ground all the countries can agree to. That's why this has led to the endorsement of the concept by the General Conference in 2015. It was 195 member states. They agreed to this for wrong principles. I, re I recall before we want to roll, write this for principle to the resolution, draft resolution, which even within the house, as our colleagues can perceive this, it can be too bold to fly, but eventually we succeeded. And then several years after, we submitted these 303 indicators to the Council of IPDC. Uh, also, <coughs> also a huge debate, but after a three-hour debate, it was endorsed. You can see on the picture, I'm so proud that my colleague Alexandra Barbosa was presenting the initial, the first pioneering pilot study of indicators to the IPDC Council, which gave us such a living example to convince our member state to endorse this voluntary assessment of indicators. And as my colleague Doris just excellently pointed out, IFAP is another sister intergovernmental agency uh, body of UNESCO. They have also well recognized this indicator in line with their priority area. I understand there are already a number of national IFAP committees in place. I mean, in the, pro, in the implementation process, we are not intending to create, create wheels, reinvent wheels many times. If there's already a multi-stakeholder mechanism, a structure in place like the National Committee of IFAP, we are willing, we are ready to work with this committee to start the process of assessment in the country. We already seen a few examples on ground in the, uh, in, in, at the national level to do this assessment. So we count on IFAP chair and the entire IFAP community support. Uh, Global advocacy has been going on and on, and we hope these indicators are giving this global community an uh, option, a uh, holistic vision about uh, the digital side. That's why we are present in WESIS IGF, the regional dialogue of IG in Europe, Asia Pacific, Latin America. We're also working with many NGO, civil side driven society, uh, initiatives and also many national initiatives. So I, I hope that you can also actively participate in all kinds of uh, um, advocacy. And our forthcoming event will be in, uh, in, in Ghana, Freedom Online Coalition Conference in next February. We, also in, we are also going to uh, the, the, the forthcoming uh, Eurodig in next year. I mean, so it's really everywhere. We are also building up extensive partnership at the global and national levels. As you see, we are working with the Council of Europe, uh, who is uh, presenting this indicator to the Minister's uh, Council. We are working with OECD, with uh, uh, continue our uh, um, partnership with uh, a civil society like APC and also media organization like G uh, GFMD, and uh, with uh, citizen debates initiative, which is called uh, Mission Mission Public. They are also going to be present in the closing session of this event. So here is a Bible. Here is the product we just showcased. It uh, has uh, set uh, out clearly the six categories, 25 themes and the 24, 124 questions and the 303 indicators, which has been uh, well, well developed by our leading author, David Souter, and his team in collaboration with the entire APC research consortium, which, in, which consists of four different research agencies covering four <laughs> different continents. I really deeply uh, thank the excellent work from our partner APC consortium led by uh, David Stern and also Henriette. I, I, I hope Henriette is here, if he can, he can hear me. So now I'm um, um, 
I'm giving the floor to my colleague David Suter, just uh, <laughs> uh, stressing the three objectives why we are encouraging the member states and the country to do assessment, uh, simply to assess and also to give, the, to give the policy recommendations for the actions so that we can have a more uh, empirical policy improvement at the national level. Okay, well, thank you, Zhan Hong. Um, and my name is David Suter. As Zhan Hong said, I led the um, independent group uh, that was commissioned by UNESCO to do this work involving APC, Association for Progressive Communications, and several research centers in um, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, and what I'll do is take a quick look through the framework which was agreed through the process that uh, Zhan Hong's described. So the Rome principles uh, identify four aspects of internet environments which are important to UNESCO and fall within its mandate. And they're identified by its four opening letters, R for rights, O for openness, A for access or accessibility to all, as UNESCO puts it, M for multi-stakeholder participation. And for each of those, uh, the indicator framework sets out a number of different themes. Um, and the first of these themes in those four cases is concerned with policy, legal, and regulatory frameworks. Uh, while the others address particular aspects of the theme. I'll come on to those in a moment. It's clear that um, these, though, are not the only dimensions that one needs to consider when looking at the internet environment. So alongside these, we uh, included a fifth category of cross-cutting indicators, which I'll come on to a bit later as well. So I'll say a word about each of the categories shortly, but it's worth um, underlining some basic principles behind the assessment. Um, there are a lot of indicators in this framework, 300 in the main set, 100 in the core set, um, and that is deliberate. As people would say, that this is a lot of indicators. In fact, this is deliberate, and it's because of the variability in the evidence that there is available between countries. In some countries, there's a lot. In other countries, there's not very much. And the aim of this framework is to help those who are making an assessment to build up a comprehensive picture from the evidence that is available in their countries, so a mosaic. Um, there won't be answers to all of these indicators, all of these questions in each country, but there will be sufficient answers to sufficient of them to build up that comprehensive picture in a way that other indicator frameworks don't allow. So there are a large number of indicators because of the lack of information in some countries, not despite it. And for the same reason, there are three types of indicator here in this framework. There are quantitative indicators based on statistics. There are qualitative indicators which are based on a much wider range of information, including commentaries by informed and credible observers. And there are institutional indicators which are based on the existence and functioning of different types of, of governance. Um, and lastly, there, it's worth saying there are 10 contextual indicators which we included about demography and other factors around a country which help to place that country in its global context. So I'll um, say something about uh, the methodology shortly as well, but to, to run through the, uh, the categories, um, first category is concerned with rights, and it has six themes which are drawn from the international rights regime. Uh, so in addition to the policy, legal, and regulatory framework, these look at freedom of expression, access to information, freedom of association and political participation, the right to privacy, and economic, social, and cultural rights. And then the second category is concerned with openness, so the extent to which the internet environment is open to active participation by all stakeholders. Uh, and there, in addition to the policy, legal, and regulatory framework, um, we're looking at open standards, open markets or competition, uh, open content, and open data and open government. The third category is concerned with access, or as UNESCO puts it, accessibility to all. Um, so here again, the first category, uh, the first theme is concerned with policy, legal, and regulatory frameworks. After that, uh, it, it looks at connectivity and usage, affordability, equitable access, which is evidence reflecting the participation of all different social groups within society, local content and language, and capabilities and competencies to use the internet. So the themes that formed the basis of which, uh, that around the time of WUSIS, we used to call real access. And then the fourth category is concerned with multi-stakeholder participation uh, at both national and international levels. Now, this fifth category of cross-cutting indicators is really important. Um, 
uh, and there are five uh, themes within this. The first two are concerned with the participation of particular demographic groups. So the gender theme is concerned with the relative participation of women and men. And then the children theme with the rights and usage and protection of children online. And the other three themes here are about broad aspects of the internet and its implications for wider digital society and human development. So they're concerned with sustainable development, with trust and security, and with legal and ethical aspects of the internet. So obviously I don't have time to go into any of these in detail here. Um, I hope that you will look at them in, uh, in the book itself uh, and see the broad range uh, of, of issues that are covered. So we have categories, within those categories we have themes, um, and within those themes we have a number of questions and for each question, there are indicators. So it's quite a complicated and elaborate framework, but it looks, it's, it's straightforward to follow, as I hope people have found in making use of it. Uh, some general points. So each of the themes in each of the categories includes a number of questions. There won't necessarily, as I say, be answers to those in every country. And in fact, it's most unlikely there would be. But the variety and range of those questions and indicators should enable researchers to build up a substantive picture of what's happening in a way that isn't possible through other kinds of indicator framework. Um, must all of the indicators be included? Well, no, um, because usually there will be insufficient resources to do that, and that was recognized during the design. It's why, as well as the full set of indicators, there's a core set of around 100. They're drawn across the, the framework as a whole, uh, usually two to three themes per, uh, per category uh, and, uh, and a smaller number of questions per theme. So they're not as comprehensive, but they have been piloted, they've been shown to be effective, and they're the basis for, for what you're going to hear about later in the, in, in the session. Um, whether researchers use the full set or the core set, the aim is to find out what's happening. Um, so those who are making decisions about the future are better informed and have a better understanding of where the national internet lies in relation to the Rome principles, and on that basis to make recommendations. So the evidence should be gathered and assessed objectively, and the recommendations should be prepared with an eye on practicality. Uh, and the framework's not intended to be undertaken casually. It's not a tick box exercise that you can do in a couple of days. It needs time, commitment, and resources, and the involvement of a number of researchers with different kinds of expertise and different perspectives. Hence, the importance of being a multi-stakeholder approach. It's not something new to UNESCO. Uh, UNESCO's had media development indicators along similar lines for a decade, uh, which have been really valuable in a number of countries. And uh, so these indicators can, and I hope, will be even more valuable than those. Methodology. Um, so the publication includes a, a guidance on how researchers should undertake assessments built around these eight points. Um, beginning with the establishment of a multi-stakeholder advisory board. So these indicators are not intended to be a tool for advocacy by one particular stakeholder group. They're meant to be a tool for understanding by all stakeholder groups collectively and collaboratively. Um, from that, the building of a collaborative research team and a collaborative research plan. Data gathering from a variety of sources available within the country, which is going to vary from place to place. And the publication includes guidance on the kinds of information sources to look for, um, official reports and statistics, independent analyses and commentaries, some international data sets, discussions with credible local informants. Credible being an important word here. Um, the information should be analyzed collectively by the group with the research team writing a report and making recommendations as a team, so incorporating their different expertise and perspectives. And then it's hoped that this will end with a, a validation workshop, bringing in a wider range of people from within the country, the opportunity to discuss the findings and implications for public policy, and ultimately a monitoring approach uh, over the following years. Um, so lastly from me, before going back to Shen Hong, um, this is the structure that's recommended for a national assessment report. Um, in each section, for each question, uh, uh, in each theme, there should be a short text which responds to the, the questions asked using the indicators for which evidence is available. That text should be clear and succinct and objective, 
And then the chapter as a whole should end with recommendations that draw on the findings and are agreed by the research team, building on their diverse expertise and experience. Um, none of these get published, but a number are in course of preparation. Uh, I recently peer-reviewed the report from Brazil, which I think was an excellent example of what can be done with the indicators, uh, and so we'll be hearing from, about that later. Um, so that's where, that's where this came from and what we were trying to do, and I'll hand you back to Shan Hong. Uh, thank you so much, David. I will be very quick in the last slide. This one is to showcase the progress in the past 11 months after the indicator was endorsed. It's amazingly, we are able to deploy assessment in 12 countries. And as you can see the, on the map, in, in Africa, we are having Benin, Senegal, Kenya, Ghana, all on board. And in Arab states, we have Tunisia, we have Sudan also on board. In Asia, we have the projects ongoing in Thailand and in Nepal. In Latin America, it's also one of the leading continent of this project. We have Brazil as the first country who did the assessment, who the, and the report will be published at the first edition of UNESCO series publication of national assessment of Rome indicators. We also have Paraguay, we work with Ecuador, and even more countries uh, coming up. And, uh, and even in Europe, in the uh, developed world, we also received the expression of interest from a number of European countries as well. We also have a session um, for European countries to <coughs> assess these indicators because it's uh, really relevant to North and South for all the countries to, uh, to tackle the common challenges. Um, this one just uh, to share the really the most uh, uh, glorious moment of this indicator project. We have the validation workshop being held in a number of countries already. And we also I'm happy to see our colleagues from picture now today live in the room. Uh, I wish to see more <laughs> this kind of picture. So the idea is if you found this indicator in, relevant to your country, it's not yet on our map yet, please let us know. We are standing here to provide all the support. I think we should give them a round of applause. Well, we've heard about how these indicators were designed, and we've heard about the initial uh, steps for implementation and uh, understanding some of the lead countries. I would now like to invite um, for the next session um, some experiences from around the world. And we would start with um, Mr. Eric Indumba, who is a special advisor to the minister in um, the Republic of Congo. Unfortunately, the minister couldn't be with us today, um, but they are very involved in um, many different areas that relate strongly to these indicators. He will be speaking in French, so um, can I just check if people have headsets? Do you have headsets for the translation? Do we have headsets in the room? So we have translators, but we don't have headsets. I think it will be consecutive. I think we do have translation, right? I, I'm sorry, Miss. Uh, I think that uh, technical support could you inform is there the translation interpretation? Okay, I, we will do it as you go along. Donc, euh, si vous parlez, je vais essayer de traduire. Donc, euh, après quelques phrases, vous attendez un peu. Okay. Donc, euh, vous avez la parole. Merci. C'est un plaisir pour moi aujourd'hui de m'adresser à vous au nom du ministre des Postes, des Télécommunications et de l'économie numérique de la République du Congo. 
Son Excellence Monsieur Léon Justibumbo pour vous délivrer ce message euh, à l'occasion du pré-événement organisé par l'UNESCO, prélude à l'ouverture du Forum global sur la gouvernance de l'Internet. Permettez-moi d'exprimer ma profonde gratitude à l'ensemble des hautes personnalités réunies ici. Je salue de manière particulière la forte participation des experts du numérique euh, venus d'horizons divers pour prendre part à ce rendez-vous. Can I stop you? So he is uh, explaining that he is delivering them on behalf of his minister the message, uh, giving everybody warm greetings, especially those digital experts from around the world. Yeah. Le gouvernement du Congo est très sensible à ce genre uh, d'assises. Pour nous, elle est la marque insigne de l'intérêt que nous portons tous au développement de l'Internet. Go ahead. Cette activité qui nous réunit aujourd'hui se situe dans le prolongement des rencontres multi-acteurs euh, que nous organisons régulièrement dans nos pays euh, respectifs sur la problématique du bien-être de cet espace virtuel qui est euh, l'Internet. So he is saying that in his country they often organize meetings to review how healthy this sector is. Donc euh, cette journée est spéciale précieuse et préfigurateur, euh, j'en suis convaincu qu'elle va faire naître euh, une nouvelle forme de vision de l'Internet, la réflexion sur l'universalité de l'Internet, son impact social, économique, culturel et des évolutions techniques dont les évolutions techniques est l'affaire du secteur public, secteur privé et des autres communautés. Tout le monde est partie prenante. Le sommet mondial sur la société de l'information qui donna naissance à ce genre euh, d'initiative fut un sommet multi-acteur. He is saying that um, it's an excellent thing that they have this kind of engagement from all the stakeholders, whether it's private sector, civil society or government, and it follows within the optic of the World Summit on Information Society, which was a truly multi-stakeholder event. Donc, fort de cela, euh, Son Excellence M. Denis Sassou le président de la République du Congo, chef de l'État, inscrit notamment dans notre secteur des postes de télécommunications et l'économie numérique, à travers son projet de société et la marche vers le gouvernement, allant plus, plus, plus loin ensemble, d'arrimer le Congo au développement de l'économie numérique. Cette volonté se traduit non seulement par l'implémentation des infrastructures indispensables au développement de l'Internet, mais aussi par l'organisation cohérente de la gestion de cet espace numérique, notamment l'universalité de l'Internet. Yes, so he's saying that uh, the vision of his president is to firmly place this country um, uh, to emphasize the importance of the digital economy uh, for his country. And uh, this is not just at the level of uh, infrastructure, but also at the level of understanding how to manage the digital economy better. Donc, mesdames et messieurs, nous le savons tous aujourd'hui que l'Internet a rendu chaque existence plus intense en donnant l'impression que chaque être humain pouvait vivre mille vies en une et donc plus, plus, plus qu'un changement technologique. C'est une ré révolution technologique, culturelle, sociale et philosophique qui est immiscée dans chaque strate de l'activité humaine disait euh, un grand chef d'État euh, euh, de l'Europe. Et cette révolution technologique est d'ailleurs toujours euh, en cours. Chaque jour, la liste des évolutions s'allonge, notamment avec l'intelligence artificielle, l'Internet des objets et plusieurs autres encore, qui nous laissent envisager d'immenses progrès en matière de santé, euh, de sécurité, de culture et d'éducation. Yes, he's saying that the nature of the digital revolution is such that today each person can live a thousand lives. Um, it's uh, a revolution that is ongoing, and in particular, given um, new developments such as the artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things, there are immense opportunities for helping development. Donc, le vrai défi euh, que devait relever évidemment le processus de l'universalité de l'Internet est l'intégration des aspects techniques, politiques car il est difficile d'opérer une distinction nette entre les deux. En fin de compte, chaque solution ou option technique promet certains intérêts, donne du poids à un certain groupe et, dans une certaine mesure, affecte la vie sociale, politique et économique. Vous pouvez continuer. 
Allez-y. Donc la croissance d'Internet et l'émergence des nouveaux acteurs de la gouvernance ont rendu difficile l'ouverture d'intégrale des questions techniques et politiques. Les réformes qui ont suivi, euh, y compris la création de l'ICAN, ont permis de rétablir la cohérence entre les aspects techniques et politiques. Des nouveaux services sont introduits presque tous les jours, ce qui entraîne les difficultés supplémentaires dans l'organisation des débats sur l'universalité de l'Internet et évidemment son, son implémentation. C'est dans ce cadre qu'il faudra une approche holistique qui devrait permettre d'aborder plus facilement ces aspects, non seulement, euh, euh, ces aspects non seulement techniques, mais aussi dans un cadre juridique, euh, social, culturel, économique, développementaux de l'évolution de l'Internet. Cette approche devrait aussi tenir compte de la convergence croissante des technologies numériques, y compris la migration des services de télécommunication vers les fournisseurs d'accès Internet. Okay. He's saying that there are many challenges associated with the internet development in different uh, in countries and that the way to uh, address all those challenges require a multi-stakeholder approach and that uh, the ICANN and all the system put in place within countries where the, all the different actors can come together to address the issues is very, uh, is very important. Alors, je pense qu'il est important de dire combien nous vivons en effet ce moment important je peux ici dire au nom du gouvernement que je représente que la communauté que nous formons et qui permet à l'Internet de fonctionner est éminemment importante. L'Internet au Congo, je vais dire, je prends le cas particulier du Congo, euh, fonctionne euh, et un grand nombre de nos citoyens sont connectés et en dépit euh, des incidents cybernétiques qui émaillent régulièrement notre société, nous faisons tous une confiance presque aveugle à nos outils numériques du quotidien. Et pour les plus jeunes générations, l'Internet est devenu une évidence absolue. Elles euh, embiront presque que chaque invention ait pu un jour ne pas exister. Et vous êtes plusieurs au quotidien à améliorer chaque jour l'usage ou à déployer l'usage partout sur le territoire ou à travers le monde. Nos entreprises, nos administrations oublieront aussi presque l'Internet auquel nous tenons tous peut parfois être menacé. Um, in Congo, internet, the number of users on the internet has been increasing over the years and also companies are uh, investing in an innovative way in the use of internet and uh, this, the country is going to take the opportunity to uh, continue development toward more use of internet in the country. Et c'est un risque qui est à l'œuvre si nous n'arrivons pas à trouver des bonnes formes de régulation les bonnes formes d'espace collectif, parce que les faiblesses et les failles du système ne sont pas à ce jour contenues dans les moyens considérables déployés par l'État par des stratégies de défense face aux cyberattaques, qu'elles soient d'origine étatique ou criminelle. L'Internet est aussi menacé dans ses contenus ainsi que dans les services qu'il procure, parce que la liste, euh, la liste des pathologies du net s'allonge de jour en jour. There are, however, many challenges that need to be addressed, not only from legal, but also from technical perspective. And the country is in committed to ensure that those challenges are effectively addressed. Donc, le gouvernement et l'ensemble des acteurs euh, euh, ne vont pas pouvoir tolérer encore longtemps euh, les torrents de haine euh, que déversent en ligne les acteurs euh, protégés par l'anonymat, devenus problématiques. Donc, aujourd'hui, en 2019, euh, à un autre tournant, non seulement l'Internet est menacé, mais l'Internet commence euh, à être décrit lui-même par certains comme une menace, singulièrement dans les sociétés démocratiques. Dans le pays, le pays a été face aux problèmes de hate species et le gouvernement est committé à adresser ce problème. Et non seulement ça, actuellement, dans le pays, il y a des gens qui considèrent que l'Internet is uh, an issue for development and it's up to the, to the government to ensure that there is uh, a part that all the stakeholders come together to discuss how this can be addressed to ensure that internet can become a tool for development. Donc pour résumer très rapidement pour euh, je veux dire face à tous ces enjeux le gouvernement congolais par le biais du ministère des postes et télécommunications et l'économie numérique a élaboré la cyberlégislation qui euh, au jour d'aujourd'hui est effective et adoptée par les deux chambres du Parlement. La législation est composée des textes ci après. 
la loi portant sur la lutte contre la cybercriminalité, la loi portant sur la cybersécurité, la loi sur la protection des données à caractère personnel, la loi portant sur les transactions électroniques et enfin, nous avons mis en place l'Agence nationale de sécurité des systèmes d'information euh, chargée de mettre en application les lois précitées. There are, in the country, there are a series of laws that have been adopted on electronic trans trans transactions, on cyber criminality, and also there is an institution that has been established to ensure, to ensure the enforcement of the laws. Donc il y a tellement de choses à dire que je suis obligé de m'arrêter là euh, pour l'instant. Euh, sur ce, euh, je vous remercie. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, it's very interesting for me uh, to understand these developments in Congo. I think that it's a reflection of what's happening around that world. We realize that there are huge benefits but then there are also um, serious challenges that we have to take into account. And part of it uh, you have addressed in your speech, explaining to us the many excellent laws that have been put in place. Uh, but there's also a general uh, issue of information literacy and getting the population to understand how best to use as well as um, the kind of uh, challenges they have to avoid. So thank you so much for that excellent intervention. I would now like to invite uh, the Vice Minister of Information and Communication from the Republic of Paraguay, a beautiful country which I hope to visit one day. Um, he has a PhD in education with a focus on innovation. And um, I think that really uniquely qualifies him for the position that he holds uh, now. But previously, he was also the president and founder of a not-for-profit organization which worked on social assistance. And um, he's been instrumental in many civil society organizations in Paraguay, uh, particularly focused on education. So um, I'll invite you now to make your remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Mr. Miguel Martin. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. It's uh, very good for us to be invited to this meeting. <laughs> As a country, we show the importance for us to be here. Just, uh, we, it's not only me who came to this meeting, but also three organizations and a congressman has been invited. And this shows the importance for us, not only to understand what we have to do as a country, but to also show the world what we are able to do and what, and, and, uh, the road we want to take in order to do this. In, at this point, we are in a very good position for Paraguay since we, are, we just created a ministry of technology. We didn't have that. And that gives us a really good position in order to build the policies for, for ICT. Before, we had different ways or different um, visions on how to do this. But now as a ministry, uh, by law, we have the objective of, or the responsibility to build these policies. One of them, obviously, is regarding the internet usage. And we are uh, trying to work together as a multi-stakeholder position we, we, uh, where we invited all the civil society who are working on this, ISOC and others, and also uh, participating in meetings with ICANN, asked them help to build this together. Uh, this policy also has a very, very important participation of the Congress, and uh, our challenges are big, but we, we have also seen how our neighbors have been um, uh, growing in this area. So uh, we're very happy that also we are at this point where we have money to do this. We, uh, we just invested in it. We, we just uh, asked for a loan 
to have this project in digital uh, age, digital, um, digital, it's called, like a digital uh, um, project for everything, just infrastructure, e-government, I'll tell them, tell you later what, we'll be, what, what we have. But for the first time, we have a ministry, we have uh, a plan and projects for this, uh, to build this, and we also have uh, the government interest to build this as a multi-stakeholder, not just uh, the position of the government to uh, build this up and down, uh, but bottom from up is what we want to do. And we are also receiving help from the others, our neighbors, who started this um, years ago. And we're seeing their steps, uh, what they did wrong, we will not try to take those steps, but what they did right, we will try to go that way. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about this experience in Paraguay. Um, you are reaping the benefits of the others who have gone before and making sure that it's multi-stakeholder uh, from the very beginning. Thank you for those remarks. I would now like to invite Mira Milosevic from the Global Forum for Media Development uh, to give her remarks, and um, she is the executive director of the Brussels-based Global Forum for Media Development, and uh, before that, she has served as a chief platform officer at Indie Voices and director of the Belgrade uh, Media Center. Um, I see that you were the author of the World Press Trends Report, which I think all of us enjoy reading, even though we are a bit worried by certain developments today. Um, so we have had two speakers from government, um, the minister from Congo and the vice minister from Paraguay, and now we move uh, to civil society. Thank you. Oh yeah, it has a button. Dear, um, your excellences, dear chair and dear colleagues, um, we are really grateful for the opportunity to participate in today's discussion. Um, and it's quite an honor to be following um, two distinguished speakers and our colleagues from UNESCO. We are... Um, Global Forum for Media Development, a network of more than 200 organizations, civil society organizations mostly, uh, from more than 17 countries around the world. We support uh, freedom of uh, media, freedom of expression, journalism, and media development worldwide. Given the role that uh, internet has nowadays in um, producing, distributing content, forming our information ecosystems, as well as interacting with all the audiences and citizens, we see that the future, the sustainability, and even the very existence of professional journalism and news media are nowadays directly linked to the way in which different layers of internet are regulated and managed. And UNESCO, our colleagues, and um, a community where we usually operate understood this for a long time. But this hasn't been recognized by many actors in this very complex internet governance universe. And up to now, um, up to the development of these uh, internet universality indicators, we had a number of mechanisms to monitor and measure the state of rights and freedoms around the world. However, when it comes to monitoring and measuring the state of internet, in relation to human rights and development, we lacked a holistic approach. We lacked comprehensive approach, and international community so far has been mostly focused on technical aspects of, of internet, and very little on content layers. Even with sustainable development goals indicators, if you look into all of them, 
there are very few that comprehensively report on all major aspects of internet. And of course, this comes from a simple fact that we all believe that the very nature of internet and by just having access to it will bring more freedom, more access to information for everyone and diverse communities as well, more opportunities and ultimately more open and just societies. We all believe this. However, the current crisis of sustainability and trust in institutions, the threats to democracies that we are seeing everywhere in the world, the shrinking space, civil space for civil society in many countries, has thrown this question that we will be asking many times over um, this Internet Governance Forum, is what kind of internet we want and what kind of internet we need. And if the tre this trend of increasing threats to democratic processes and institutions continues, including the threats to freedom of expression, media freedom, and journalism safety, we will fail to create conditions for a future that we described by the Agenda 2030, and we will certainly fail to reach sustainable development goals. We had a review of certain goals this summer um, at the High Level Political Forum uh, in New York, and although we see progress in many of the areas of the Sustainable Development Goals, the report that was produced by UNDP on the Goal 16 uh, that is related to peaceful, just, and equitable society sh is showing that if current trends of threats to our democratic societies continue, any progress that we have achieved towards empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality is highly likely to be halted or even reversed. We have, as I said, um, that we have seen over the last couple of years that majority of important decisions on how different layers of internet, but especially content layer of internet, uh, are managed, regulated, and shaped is happening in an interesting interaction between um, mostly governments and private sector, private companies. From fake news laws to deciding how political advertising will be managed on large platforms, there is, and we have to admit it, a lack of true multi-stakeholderism. Civil society, academia, and intergovernmental organizations are often missing from these important conversations. We need urgently proactive internet governance policies to drive systemic change to get to the internet that we would like to see. And we can develop evidence-based policy only if we have indicators that define, monitor, and analyze the internet from the perspective of human rights and genuine multidisciplinary approach. And this is what UNESCO's in internet uh, indicators are bringing. And it is very important for our community and is very welcome. We don't have anything comparable that links together freedom of expression, access to information, with indicators of open markets, how digital markets are regulated, uh, where is the local content, uh, especially in different languages, what is the affordability, uh, and uh, what role has open data and open government in sustainable development. Community that I represent here will be using these indicators through all aspects of our work. As I mentioned, journalism and news media voices are some of the most absent from these policy spaces. And even though these conversations are often meant to be inclusive and multi-stakeholder. That's why on Wednesday, together with our partners, including UNESCO, we are launching a dynamic coalition on sustainability of journalism and news media here within the Internet Governance Forum. And I would like to invite all of you to join us in addressing this content layer of internet uh, together. We look forward to continuing our cooperation with UNESCO, with you, and all our partners and interested actors. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I don't think we can ever overemphasize the importance of content. And I really liked your remarks because you actually touched on all the dimensions of IFAP's work. Uh, information for development, information ethics, uh, information literacy, 
information access and multilingualism. We have one other uh, dimension, which is information preservation. But as rightly pointed out by the minister from Congo, as well as a uh, vice minister from Paraguay, in the past, our tendency has to, been to focus on infrastructure. And now we are realizing with uh, the monopolization that we see in surveillance capitalism and the erosion of, you could say, journalists' rights, but in, through journalists, all of our rights, we are seeing that we have to pay attention to a lot more of this. And um, we will, this is a unique role for UNESCO as well in that uh, we are looking through these indicators, not just at the national level, but some of the global trends that we are seeing that require the kind of multilateral institution that UNESCO is to bring the actors together to really discuss what kind of future are we building through this uh, digitization? What kind of social impacts are we seeing? What kind of social impacts do we want to see? So thank you for those remarks. And now it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce um, our final speaker for this session, who is the minister from Ecuador. Who has taken my notes? Uh, buenos días con todos. Um, mi nombre es Berioska Torres. Uh, Maybe if I can just finish. Uh, the Under Secretary of Information Development and Online Government of the Republic of Ecuador. Yes. And she will be speaking in Spanish and it will be translated by my colleague, uh, Guillaume. So Guillaume, if you can give us a bit of background on the secretary, please. Thank you. No, please. Um, buen día con todos. Um, soy Berioska Torres, subsecretaria de Fomento a la Sociedad de la Información en representación del Ministerio de Telecomunicaciones. Um, <clears throat> conocer, tener información y referencias que nos permitan mejorarnos a nosotros mismos han sido claves desde el inicio de la humanidad. So, um, just for interpretation, she uh, was presenting herself. She's the Undersecretary for Foment and the Information Society in Ecuador, in the Ministry of Information, Communication and Technologies. And um, she's introducing, saying the importance of uh, knowledge uh, for all of us uh, from the beginning of our societies. Okay. Hace unas décadas no conocíamos mucho de nuestros propios países o pasaba mucho tiempo hasta tener información confiable. So a few decades ago we didn't know a lot about our own countries and it took and it take a long time to know more about the inputs we need to build our policies. Y duplicaba el tiempo para saber lo que hacían nuestros vecinos o la región a la que pertenecemos. And the same, it's twice the time to know our neighbors and the region where we were inserted. En la actualidad, esto es posible con las herramientas planteadas en los indicadores de la universalidad del Internet. And nowadays, with the tools that are set in the Internet Universality Indicators, we are able to acknowledge this kind of uh, knowledge for knowing the policies in the region and the country. Permitiendo que con este grupo de ROAMX podamos identificarnos y compararnos. So with uh, Rowan X, we can identify ourselves, but also compare with our neighbors and other countries. Además de tomar decisiones, plantear mejoras en la política pública con la información creada por todos los actores y recolectada en menos tiempo. And also to take better decisions, to take decisions on reform public policies with uh, recollecting this information and data that are produced by different players. 
nos permite conocernos, alinear nuestras visiones y participar en conjunto. This allows us to know each other, to align our decisions and to plan together. Lo que es clave en esta nueva sociedad de la información. Which is key in the new, this new information society. Ecuador ha venido dando pasos para mejorar esta situación y más adelante eh, les comentaré sobre el resultado de los indicadores. Ecuador has uh, introducing steps to improve this situation and later on in the Latin American session she will give details on the assessment of the Internet Universality Indicators in Ecuador. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. William, and could you sum up what she said? Sure. So, very briefly, uh, the Under Secretary has underlined for her the importance of the existence of Roanex as a tool uh, for building new policies, for assessing the situation, but also for planning together with other countries and knowing the situation in other countries for comparable reasons. Um, and she's saying that Ecuador is using the results of this and will use the results of this for their uh, planning process in this. Uh, Ministry of uh, Information and Technology. Thank you very much. Um, that brings this part of the session to an end, and I will now hand over to my colleague, uh, Xiang Hong, for the next session. I want to thank all of the speakers. I think that you've given us a good framework for the discussions uh, that are going to take place uh, today. And I would just like to encourage everyone to be as frank as possible uh, because uh, what we are talking about in this room has the potential to affect many lives, both, uh, and I hope to affect them positively. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. I'd also like to thank you your excellent moderation and also insightful kind of sharing of your ideas in this moderation. Um, so now I think we can move on. I um, apologize for the delay of the program because now we are at 10.10, uh, but on the program we are still uh, with the Africa now. And um, as Doris suggested that uh, since we don't have so much time for the question and answers, so if anyone you want to raise a question, have some comments, can, um, you can put it in writing and give it to me. We will, we will be able to discuss maybe in our last session uh, from uh, after lunchtime we still have the, we are running to 1.30, so we are able to take a, take a question all together. So now I'm uh, giving the floor to uh, our uh, colleague, uh, Elvis Michael Kanu, who is the advisor in our Western Africa. He is going to moderate a session for the country assessment in Africa. Uh, Michael, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Xiao Hong. Uh, thank you, distinguished guest and dear participant. Um, I also want to thank uh, the presentation at the beginning that uh, uh, let us have a clear understanding on how the Internet Universality Indicators was designed, what uh, uh, the methodology and how it's been applied. Now we are going to move to the examples of how in some countries in Africa this has been put into practice. It has been piloted in Senegal and Benin, and also it's going on in Kenya. There are also uh, other countries considering um, assessing uh, internet universality indicators in at national level. Uh, during this session, we'll be having presentation from different countries. We're having from Kenya by Grace uh, Gitaiga, and then from Senegal and from Benin, and finally from uh, Ghana. I'll start with giving the floor to Grace Gitaiga from KICNET for the presentation on Ghana. Kenya. Kenya, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> so like you've been told, my name is Grace Gitaiga. I convene the Kenya ICT Action Network which is Kiktonet, and I noticed on the program it's misspelled. There's an A in between T and N, so Kiktonet. Now, um, we have been undertaking uh, this assessment uh, 
of the universality indicators. And I'm just going to give um, like a process of what has happened and what we have done so far. Now, the process, there were six processes that we were supposed to undertake uh, as we go through the internet universality indicators. Uh, action one, we already established a multi-stakeholder advisory board. This was followed by step two. We already built a collaborative research team. So we have a team of 10 researchers, um, one lead researcher in each indicator, and then one uh, assistant researcher uh, to support the lead researcher. So in total, we have 10. And we have two editors, and we have one uh, like main uh, person who will look at their entire research once we are done to tell us whether uh, there are any gaps that we need to fill up. Then we also developed a research action plan. We have gathered the data. Uh, we actually um, we did the first step of data analysis and we are in the process of writing the report and uh, the recommendations. Now, in writing the report and recommendations, then we, we find that there are certain gaps, and so you know, we ask the researchers to get us more data and to do more analysis. So this process is actually uh, iterative, so you know, going back and forth before we finish. Uh, in terms of what is pending, we still uh, have two steps. One is we still need to organize a national uh, validation multi-stakeholder workshop and conduct related activities, and then uh, come up with a way of you know, assessing the impact and the monitoring process. Now, uh, we have had challenges. One of the challenge is access to data. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, there is anecdotal data, but uh, when you are conducting research, then you need uh, what is empirical. And we've had challenges, especially in getting some of this data that we are told this is what happens in Kenya, and we are saying, where is it? Can we see? Can we assess? So we've also finding that there have been gaps in that, even in terms of the data that has been accessible, because some of the things, you know, are not are not actually, uh, you know, tabulated or, you know, available empirically. Uh, we've also had a challenge with the timelines. So, you know, UNESCO Paris office, um, you know, gave us these are the timelines. When it came to local actualization, there were challenges within which we started, uh, within which we, we needed to start uh, the research but we are catching up. We realize that countries like Brazil are already ahead of us. Then in terms of cost, we've actually realized it's a challenge because we would have wanted to have more engagement with smaller groups, like if it's the businesses, bring them together. Because sometimes getting people to respond to a questionnaire has also its own challenges. So usually we've realized that it's much better to bring people into focus group discussions and then get them to respond to all the questions that we need. And uh, because we have um, our own challenges in terms of cost, then that uh, means that we really sometimes have to beg these people to give us the information. Then we've also had um, a challenge with government participation. Um, so the person designated to participate um, in this process is very busy with other processes also. He's the same person who attends ITU meetings and sometimes ITU meetings are very uh, many. So, you know, I think the person felt there's, uh, um, you know, he's kind of loaded and um, has not been, you know, uh, very uh, active in our session. And then one of the things we have also found as a challenge is that this task looked very easy, but it's actually complicated, especially when you're dealing with multiple teams of researchers. And then, you know, there's this pressure of meeting the deadlines. 
Um, so initially, even when we, we had the first meeting with the researchers, it looked very easy. And then you start collecting data and you realize it actually requires much more time than we anticipated. Uh, and then, of course, we've also had our own challenge convening all these multiple groups, uh, you know, convening the MAB, convening the researchers, convening other people that we want uh, them to participate. Now, in terms of emerging findings, you know, the findings, what we have found, so I'll just give a very quick, uh, you know, one for each, for each section. In terms of rights, uh, what is emerging is that laws and policies provide widely for human rights. However, implementation of key policies and legislation remains a challenge. In terms of openness, access to information, uh, lack of standards, there is lack of access to information, lack of standards, and weak legislation. In terms of accessibility, cost of internet is still relatively an issue. Uh, the cost of devices, access to networks, uh, there are also language barriers, you know, they continue to be, you know, challenge. And then in terms of multi-stakeholderism, um, we have found out that there's weak engagement, uh, weak policy or legislative framework, and lack of standards for engagement. So yeah, we are saying Kenya has a very good multi-stakeholder uh, process in policy, but uh, there isn't really a framework. So sometimes, um, like when the government needs some uh, contribution, from stakeholders in, in a certain law, they will call stakeholders, but if they're also pressed for time, they'll just give us three days. So, and then we will contribute, but we also don't see how our contributions are taken on board. So yes, there's that ticking of the box because it's also a constitutional requirement to have um, people participate in policy making process, but that engagement framework is not there. Now, in terms of cross-cutting issues, we found that implementation of policies and laws, there's that, but uh, capacity of re relevant institutions is still a challenge. And then um, just some quick key recommendations that have emerged. Uh, like I said, we are still going on with the research. Uh, there's need to have a very clear uh, framework on how policies and laws are implemented. Uh, there's need to enhance institutional capacities, those institutions charged with implementing these policies. One of the major things is that there is need to build public awareness, especially on the importance of participating in uh, policy making as is provided for in Kenya's uh, Article 10 of the Constitution. And then um, we still, there's need, still a lot of work that needs to happen to bridge the digital divide. Thanks, that's the summary. Thank you, Grace, for this um, presentation in which you highlighted uh, the process of uh, assessing internet universality indicators in Ghana. You also raise Kenya, excuse me, in Kenya, and you also raise um, some key issues that you uh, encounter during the process regarding access to data, uh, the respect of timeline, and also cost. Um, you also highlighted some of the lessons learned from the process uh, in terms of right, um, accessibility, um, multi-stakeholders, you highlighted uh, the weak engagement. Also at the um, cross-cutting uh, dimension, you also highlighted the capacity. There is a need of uh, building capacities in the country. Uh, we thank you for the, the presentation and um, we hope that uh, in the next future you will be uh, continuing with the validation of the, the report and that that will be shared for other countries to, 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 to also benefit from the experience of uh, Ghana. I don't know if you... 
there was any uh, comment, any f- reaction to that? Yes. I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure if we have time for the reaction immediately. No. Shall we, if allow us, can we finish all the presentation from four countries? And then we'll open the floor shortly because we are running half an hour late. We are informed to stop sharp at 1.30. So I prefer we uh, do all the presentation at first. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, so the next presentation will be about uh, Senegal. Uh, I'm, I'm the one presenting the uh, summary of the Senegal IUI report. Um, the Internet Universality Indicators Assessment started in Senegal in August 2018 and it ended last July 2019. Uh, as it had been said at the beginning of this session, uh, we follow with the guidelines in terms of having a multi-stakeholder advisory board, having a research team, and also having a validation workshop uh, to, uh, uh, during the process of, elaborate, of assessing the internet universality in Senegal. Now I'm about to give some of the... F- no, it begins after this. Oh, yeah. Yes, I'm talking about uh, Senegal. So, uh, in, the, in Senegal, in terms of report, please don't follow the, the slide because it's after my intervention that we will be having Benin. So, in Senegal, we have, um, we have almost finished the process. We are now in the review, at the international review of the report. And what came out from the assessment in Senegal, uh, just to present the country, is that we have a country of um, 15.7 million habitants with majority of youth, 60.5%. The country ranks low on Human Development Index. Regarding ICT Development Index, the country occupies the 18th place in Africa. And mobile connectivity is average compared to that of other countries in the region. Uh, Out of the 300 plus indicators, the report in Senegal focused on 159, among which the 109 core indicators. And uh, of the 109 core indicators, the report was able to fully uh, answer to 77%. The multi-stakeholder advisory board was composed of 28 members, chaired by the Internet Society chapter of Senegal, and the other member represented government institutions, NGOs, media organizations, academic institutions, consumer groups, private sectors, and including individual experts. Some of the findings from the report are that Senegal has a considerable advance on ICT develop, infrastructure development and deployment within the country. It has adhered to international instruments and adopted media law to guarantee human rights, including online. But enforcement is still the main challenge. Internet ecosystem drives to be equitable, but network quality is unequally available to the citizens depending on their geographical uh, position. Gender imbalance to access to internet and use of ICT is still high. The country still needs to guarantee accessibility for persons with disabilities to online content. There is limited adoption and promotion of open standards and alternative licenses in the country. There is a practice of resorting to public consultations, including online, but there is no rules or policy on the procedure for its validity, organization, and participation. In many cases, data to access the indicators were either insufficient 
or not up to date. So in terms of some of the the finding regarding the right, as I said before, the country has adopted some very good instrument at uh, international and also national level, but enforcement is still an issue. When it comes to press law, uh, the press law is not in line with international standard because it still promotes criminalization of some press offenses in the country. Regarding access to information, the law is still in the pipeline. Regarding guaranteeing direct off and online, in most cases there is no specific mention of offline versus online application of the law. The study, however, found no reported evidence of direct guarantee offline but restricted online. Regarding openness, over recent years, Senegal has updated and enriched its legislative and regulatory framework for digital economy. The country now has laws on electronic transactions, electronic communication, cyber criminality, cryptology, and more. All of these combined with the elaboration of Digital Senegal 2025 strategy, whose vision is the digital for all and for all use in Senegal with a dynamic and innovative private sector within a performing ecosystem in 2025, have contributed to creating an environment that encourages investment and innovation in available technologies. There is, however, the lack of specific policy or strategy to encourage or promote open solutions. Regarding accessibility to all, uh, the government has put in place a universal access policy and a national broadband plan. The country has a satisfactory continental ranking in terms of telecommunication infrastructure development. Nevertheless, it has focused mainly on infrastructure than on content. There is, for instance, no policy regarding the use of local languages or ensuring content accessibility for persons with disabilities. The mobile phone is the de facto the main driver for internet access in, uh, in the country. The proportion of individuals using the internet is 45% in urban areas and 29% in rural areas. There is a, digital, there is a dis disparity of internet use at gender level where, according to data from 2017 Demographic of Health Study, only 29% of women against 45% of men reported having used the internet in the past 12, 12 months. The cost of access to internet is considered high throughout the country, and according to users, the connectivity quality varies from one region to another. Senegal is ranked 20 out of 27 in Africa, uh, according to the Internet Accessibility Index. Regarding mystic stakeholder, the main actors from government to private sector, civil society organizations are involved in both national and international internet governance. There is a national forum on internet governance organized each year under the leadership of the Ministry in Charge of Digital Economy and ISOC International Society in Senegal, in which all ecosystem stakeholders participate to reflect on various themes related to internet governance. Coming on to cross-cutting themes, uh, efforts have been made within the country uh, to increase ICT integration in education and to promote digital technology in priority economy sectors. The country has adopted a series of laws on electronic transactions, as I said before, uh, to increase trust and security through the internet. However, the gender gap in ICT is still considered in terms of expertise, access, and usage. Coming now to some key policy recommendations. I'll focus mainly on some of the recommendations to the government. There were recommendations to government, academic institutions, civil society organizations, private sectors, and uh, I'll uh, just because of time go to some of the recommendations to the government. Uh, it 
is recommended that the government should accelerate the process for the adoption and enforcement of the right to information law, uh, evaluate the efficacy and strengthen the human and technical capacity of the institutions and commission in charge of enforcing legal provisions related to human rights. Strengthen the technical and human resources of the National Digital Observatory so it can provide relevant data to measure the dynamic of the digital sector. Formulate and implement a national policy for the promotion, development, and use of open solutions, including alternative licenses. Formulate and implement a national policy on the use of local language on the internet, as well as accessibility for persons with disability to online content. Formalize the current practice on resorting to public consultations, offline and online, to clarify the procedures and conditions of this validity, organization and recognition to ensure a high level of participation and diversity of participant. Address the data gap by institutionalizing ICT surveys in the national statistical development strategy with appropriate funding model. Strengthen the mechanism to combat online harassment and guarantee online privacy so as to ensure protection for children women and persons with disability. Continue the promotion of gender mainstreaming into uh, ICT with the aim to reduce gender skills use and access gaps. So here are some of the recommendations that came out from the process in Senegal. I want to stop here and thank you for your attention. I'll now move to uh, Benin and give the floor to Professor Alain Kiyundu. Merci. Je, Excusez-moi, je vais parler uh, en français. You'll be speaking in French. Yes. Um, donc, je vais commencer par uh, excuser Madame la ministre de du, la, du numérique et de la digitalisation du Bénin, Madame Aurélie Adam Soulet, qui n'a pas pu se joindre à nous parce qu'elle est prise par des séances de travail sur le budget de, du, du ministère. Alors au Bénin, donc, nous avons euh, mené euh, une enquête, une étude qui a tenté en tout cas de respecter les recommandations qui nous ont été faites, c'est-à-dire avoir un certain nombre d'actions, les huit actions qui ont été proposées donc pour la mise en œuvre des indicateurs. Donc nous avons commencé par mettre en place un conseil consultatif composé de 30 personnes, euh, je suis allé un petit peu trop vite. Et donc, dans ce conseil euh, qui est paritaire, il y avait une quinzaine de femmes donc, et une quinzaine d'hommes. Je ne sais pas si vous pouvez traduire en même temps. Oui, yeah, il est maintenant présenté la composition du Conseil Multistakeholder Advisory Board. Il a été fait de 30 personnes de différents secteurs, le gouvernement, l'académie et media professional and expert from Benin. Voilà, donc on a essayé de tout faire de façon à ce que l'équilibre de genre soit respecté, donc aussi bien dans euh, le conseil consultatif que dans l'équipe de recherche que nous avons mise en place, qui est composée de six personnes. Donc, comme vous pouvez le constater, il y a également euh, trois femmes et trois Hommes, tous originaires du Bénin, enfin habitants au Bénin. There was Bénin, gender balance amongst the multi stakeholder advisory group and also uh, amongst the research team. Et donc, à côté donc de cette équipe, il y avait moi qui coordonnais donc le travail et appuyé par un graphiste et euh, trois relecteurs. 
le, la chronologie que nous avons suivie est la suivante. Donc, nous, avons travaillé le, nous avons commencé le travail au mois d'avril et donc c'est allé très vite. On a dû commencer le travail avant même le lancement officiel de l'étude. Et nous avons pu réaliser pendant cette période trois réunions du comité consultatif. Et à chaque fois, ces réunions ont précédé, enfin souvent ces réunions ont précédé des événements. Et donc on a pu ainsi organiser une réunion du comité consultatif juste avant le lancement et une, de, une troisième réunion consultative, consultative juste avant la journée de validation. On peut voir très rapidement donc, les images pour euh, euh, montrer qu'il y a eu une affluence. Je vais revenir tout à l'heure sur les images en question. Mais ce qui est important aussi, c'est que nous avons mis en place en termes d'organisation euh, une plateforme qui nous permettait de travailler ensemble, une plateforme avec euh, un système de visioconférence, mais aussi un, un système de dépôt de documents, euh, notamment tous les entretiens que nous avons pu enregistré de façon à ce que tout le monde puisse avoir accès aux transcriptions. Ensuite, donc là, on a une image un petit peu de la journée de lancement. La salle est, est pleine. On a une, et là, on a une image donc, de, du travail du, du conseil de, de consultatif. Et euh, là, on a une image de la journée de validation et à chaque fois, nous avons été appuyés euh, par euh, les ministères, la société civile et les différents acteurs de l'économie numérique. En termes de résultats, il euh, ressort de, de cette étude qui est basée, bien entendu, sur euh, un certain nombre de techniques d'enquête. On s'est appuyé sur euh, des entretiens semi-directifs et l'analyse des bases de données, donc une cinquantaine de bases de données internationales et nationales ont été examinées. À chaque fois que nous avions euh, des résultats contradictoires, nous avions pris le parti de, euh, de garder les données qui sont nationales si, si ces données sont en contradiction avec les données euh, internationales. Donc, on a toujours privilégié les bases de données euh, nationales. La grande difficulté que nous avons rencontrée, c'est que la plupart des données au niveau national étaient datées, obsolètes. Alors, quelques résultats. Donc, au niveau de, euh, de la catégorie droit, on peut observer que le cadre législatif existe avec notamment la loi du numérique qui cadre tout ce qui est fait euh, au, au Bénin. La grande difficulté, comme dans la plupart des pays africains, c'est notamment l'écart qui peut exister entre le cadre législatif et l'application du droit en question. On, regarde, on constate également un certain nombre de divergences dans l'appréciation des éléments, notamment sur ce qui est lié à la liberté d'expression. Euh, si le gouvernement euh, pense et met en avant la liberté médiatique, on arrive à avoir des échos différents, notamment auprès de euh, reporters sans frontières, qui, en s'appuyant sur l'indice de la liberté d'expression, montre que le Bénin a considérablement reculé dans ce domaine et que son score a chuté de 12 points en 2019. Mais cette perception est différente d'autres de, 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 données qui euh, montrent les avancées dans, en termes euh, du numérique et de la liberté d'expression au Bénin. Donc on a là des données qui sont vraiment contrastées. On peut citer aussi le fait qu'il y a des actions importantes qui ont été menées dans le domaine de la cybersécurité au Bénin, qui ont hissé le pays au huitième rang au plan africain en 2018. Et aujourd'hui, le Bénin est au cinquième rang en Afrique de l'Ouest en termes de lutte contre la cybercriminalité. Euh, en termes d'ouverture, 
tout est fait pour euh, que euh, la mise en place des normes ouvertes, mais il y a encore un travail à faire qui est assez important dans le domaine de la sensibilisation des acteurs publics euh, tout, sur tout ce qui est euh, données ouvertes, mais aussi tout, sur tout ce qui est protection des données. Et en termes de en termes de, je dirais, de mise en place de dispositifs pour accéder à ces données, il y a des efforts qui sont réalisés notamment par une agence qu'on appelle l'ABSUCEP qui travaille beaucoup sur l'universalité d'Internet, sur l'accessibilité d'Internet, sur la mise en place des moyens pour que les gens même les plus reculés puissent avoir accès à Internet. En tout cas, c'est un travail qui est salué et qui est très intéressant, qui est mené dans ce domaine-là. En termes d'accessibilité, euh, on peut constater qu'au Bédin, le taux de pénétration est de 48,02 en 2018 euh, et qu'il y a des efforts qui ont été faits euh, en termes de, de coûts d'Internet et le rapport Affordability classe le pays parmi les dix premiers pays en Afrique, voilà en termes de faiblesse de coût, et cinquième de l'Afrique de l'Ouest et 29e au, au, au rang mondial, ce, ce qui me semble également appréciable. En termes de participation multi-acteurs, on a un IGF national qui fonctionne très bien au Bénin. Euh, il y a une certaine participation dans les activités euh, au niveau euh, international, mais généralement, les acteurs de la société civile manquent de moyens de déplacement pour participer aux événements auxquels ils auraient dû, euh, dû participer. Et donc là, on voit que l'indice des Nations Unies au Bénin, en termes de participation, est assez faible. Alors, je vais aller maintenant très, très vite, parce que je pense que le temps qui, a, qui a été donné est quasiment dépassé. Donc, il y a un certain nombre de recommandations qui ont été faites, des recommandations à l'endroit du gouvernement, des recommandations à l'endroit de la société civile et des recommandations à l'endroit du secteur privé. Donc, toutes ces recommandations sont résumés sur le tableau que vous pouvez voir. Ce qui est intéressant, c'est que le ministère a bien accepté ces recommandations et nous avons mis en place un comité de suivi pour surveiller la mise en œuvre de ces recommandations. Ce qui a été surprenant, c'est que c'est cette demande qui est assez surprenante on nous a demandé d'ajouter des recommandations à l'endroit de l'UNESCO. Et donc, ces recommandations à l'endroit de l'UNESCO visent le support donc, du comité de suivi, que l'UNESCO s'investisse, euh, que ne mette pas en place uniquement cette procédure et s'arrête là, mais que l'UNESCO continue à suivre la mise en place de ces indicateurs-là et en tout cas de le le fonctionnement du comité de suivi. Et pour le Bénin, le comité de suivi qui a été mis en place est composé de 12 personnes, dont 4 personnes issues des ministères, 4 personnes issues de la société civile et 4 personnes issues de l'équipe qui a rédigé le rapport en question. Voilà, je vous remercie. Thank you. We thank Alain for the presentation on Bénin in which he highlighted some of the findings in the study and conclude with highlighting that in Benin, uh, the government has accepted the recommendation that were addressed uh, to him. And also uh, there is a follow-up committee that was put in place to monitor the uh, uh, implementation of the recommendation from the report. And that also in Benin, there is a specific recommendation addressed to UNESCO for UNESCO to continue providing support to the f f uh, committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Alain, for that. Now we are going to give uh, the floor to uh, Amid Yakoub from Ghana. Ghana has not yet um, conducted the assessment uh, it's planning to do, and um, I mean, you will say more on this. 
Amint? Oh, well, oh, well, we are solving this technical issue. Uh, I'd like to do uh, two announcements uh, logistically. Uh, first, uh, I'm sorry we are canceling the coffee break because the program has been delayed. Secondly, that uh, we are going to, uh, because the program has been delayed. Uh, secondly, we are going to do a uh, group pictures at 1.30. So I count on you to stay till then we can do the picture. We will feature it on your next website for advocacy purpose. We'll do a proper news story and also meeting report. And also I'd like to thank a, a colleague, a participant already gave me the questions in writing. So we are able to handle all the questions in the last session. Uh, before we close, we have 40 minutes to handle all the questions. So thank you for your understanding. And um, I think now maybe we can also start the Ghana presentation by saving time at me because Dorothy will also co present the initiative in Ghana. So Dorothy will go first and then Hamida will Continue with the PPT. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Xiang Hong. It's been really interesting listening to the country reports so far. Um, we have a draft uh, map, you could say, a proposition of the membership of the map. But there are certain elements that have come out from those who have already conducted the exercise that I think will have to influence our map. One of which is to ensure a gender balance. Another of which is to make sure that uh, we have a balance of representation with uh, civil society as well as the private sector given uh, their importance. And then um, listening, I, this is actually a question to you, uh, Siang Hong and David, listening to the issues um, that people have mentioned with respect to timelines, as well as um, the availability of data. I'm just wondering if it makes sense in Ghana to get one researcher who would look uh, at the formal data sources and map the gaps even before we start the research so that we know what we are going to be asking our researchers to do in addition. And also I feel that it would be very important uh, to negotiate with the St Office of Statistics in the Ministry of Finance as well as our National Communication Authority, which usually collects the data for the ITU, to look at what additional elements of data will be necessary if we are going to carry out thorough assessments for the universality indicators. And I'm thinking that this is one of the low-lying fruits that um, all of us could take on uh, because uh, I have been fighting for uh, maybe almost 20 years to try and get the data that our communication authority gives to the ITU to actually be differentiated by sex. We don't have sex disaggregated data for many of the elements. Are you ready? I think we'll talk yeah. slides. Okay. So um, I was supposed to comment on Hamid's presentation. So Hamid, I, I liked your slides this morning, <laughs> but uh, they have a problem. Oh, I don't think it's so important. Oh, but you want to see it? You don't have it? Yeah. Okay, I will get it for you. But you can go ahead. You just start, I'll open it. Um, thank you. Um, the, the first slide, if, if I can recall, is um, uh, to show where Ghana is. It's on the west coast, uh, bordered by uh, Togo and Benin, and it's a democratic country. It's a lot of confidential stuff. I'm coming. Don't worry, I'll sit beside you. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, um, uh, Ghana is, uh, is on the, found on the west coast of Guinea, population of 28.8 million, um, a democratic country uh, with an executive president, um, a parliament uh, representing the people, and importantly, freedom of expression and media freedoms guaranteed by the constitution. Because this comes to play when we look at all the indicators. Um, what I'll try and do is to answer five Ws and one each. That is, we are yet to embark on, on it, yeah. Uh, traditionally, the approach of engaging information and, and communication technology is mainly focused on access and infrastructure. And that was the approach various governments in Ghana have taken, to expand access and infrastructure. When you are doing this, they think that is the right approach. That is a traditional approach to uh, the internet. And in Ghana, um, lines, the telephone licenses, they are, class, uh, they are defined by either fixed or mobile. But because of um, the way mobile has overtaken fixed lines, currently the license is to put the two together. There is no longer a fixed telephony license or a mobile telephony license. From 2019, the licensing for, for tel telephone is going to be put together without the separation. And there are six mobile phone operators in Ghana. And um, it's so unfortunate that I can't show the, the slide, but there are about six or eight different acts or laws trying to catch up with the industry and trying to expand access. For instance, we have the National Communication Act, the Electronic Communication Act, the Ele Electronic Transaction Act, the uh, National Information Technology Agency Act, Communication Service Act, Electronic Communication Regulation Tribunal Act. So you realize that governments try to catch up and try to put in new laws to be able to, to contain the way the industry is, is expanding every day. And what we intend to do with the uh, indicators is to follow the already laid principles. That is to present a comprehensive understanding of all the national indicators, environment, and policies. Access, environment, and policies to UNESCO Rome principles, and, the, uh, and then develop policy recommendations. So in effect, we are also, and then also, uh, we've already started the process. The ministry in Ghana uh, we have the Ministry of Information and Communication, one in charge of the infrastructure, one in charge of the laws. We've already gotten an endorsement of uh, these two mini ministries to conduct the indicators in Ghana. And we've already written to various stakeholders as stipulated in the, uh, in the principles of conducting the indicators. Government, the technical community, CSOs, academia, media, and uh, individual internet users. Um, Madam Dorothy drew my attention that we have to ensure that it's not top heavy when it comes to government representatives. Because if you try uh, getting reps from the technical regulators, you, you end up having a top heavy government appointees on the map. So we'll try as much as possible to get a fairly balanced um, map, and then gender, and then gender gap. So we are in the process, and I think I've been able to answer the five Ws and why each, when, where, how, and how to be able to implement these indicators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Dorothy. And we wish uh, good luck for, to Ghana for the process. And uh, I will give now the floor to Sharon for 
the continuation. Thank you so much, Elvis, for the excellent panel from Africa. Also, I think we should really applaud for the success we have achieved in the Africa continent. Um, compared to uh, Africa, we are also having several projects in Asian Pacific and uh, Arab states just uh, kicked off. We have not yet uh, finished, but uh, I also invite the uh, team leader to here to share the existing process. Um, first, I'd like to invite our uh, country team leader from Tunisia. Uh, uh, Daniel, would you please show up there? Uh, slides on the screen from Tunisia. So um, we have two um, team leaders and uh, who would like to talk first, uh, Wafa or, uh, okay. So it's, I mean, the team is, itself is a multi-stakeholder by nature. We have uh, Wafa Ban Hassin, it's the uh, commissioned uh, independent in consultant in the research team. And also we have um, Madame Karima Mohammadi representing the national regulator. So Wafa, floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Wafe Ben Hassin, and I am a consultant working on the report. Um, just to give you a brief overview of how we're going to do this today, we're going to be presenting uh, a presentation. If we could please uh, put up the PowerPoint, that would be wonderful. And uh, we will be alternating the slides. So it'll be myself, then Karima, Karima, then myself, so we can make it as interactive as possible. Um, so just a quick introduction. We started to do the national assessment for the internet universality indicators in Tunisia starting about two months ago. Um, and with me here today is Ms. Karima Mahmoudi, who is a, a director at the National Telecommunications uh, Institute of Tunisia. And um, we together form the research team of the national assessment. Um, sorry, go ahead. Which one? It is in the download file. If you go to downloads. Download. Downloads. Thank you. Yes, no? Yeah? Up, the, up there, just the one above. Yep, there you go. Thank you. And um, so Kerima and myself form the research team. We also work directly with the legal team at the ENTT, which is the National Telecom Regulator. Um, so that being said, I'll go to the next slide and Kerima will start to... This is go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wafa. Dear Excellency, dear distinguished participant, I am happy to be today here to present the assessment of the Internet Universality Indicator in Tunisia. Uh, so, as uh, Mrs. Wafa said, to, to ensure the assessment, the success of assessment of Internet University uh, Indicators, the first step is to establish a multi-stakeholders advisory board. The Tunisian multi-stakeholders advisory board is composed of UNESCO. As a framing and provision of indicators, the National Telecommunica Telecommunication Regulator, INTT, as a main national uh, organizer. The other stakeholders involved in this board are government stakeholders, ministry, as the Ministry of Women and Youth, Interior Ministry, Communication and Information Ministry. Also, we have independent oversight bodies, like access to information bodies, personal data protection institution, independent independent technical bodies and administrative bodies as national statistical institutions and others. Also, uh, this, all these institutions act as provider of data. Also, UNESCO is presented by her consultant, Mrs. Wafa. She is in charge of application of indicators and assessment. Wafa? Thank you, Please. Kerima. So um, I, would, I would like to take a moment to go through the process of how we're, we're executing the national assessment for Tunisia. Um, so the first step for us was to collect, collect data that already exists. So this involves finding data that is um, already present, that is already easily accessible. And um, to also position those, uh, the data that's available against the 109 core indicators. And to just see what, uh, to do a brief mapping of what we have so far and what we need to get and what we need to uh, have in order to make the assessment uh, successful. The second step is to draft a research plan. 
And the research plan is based on available data. Um, and then with that research plan, we see the missing gaps. What are the things in the Romex indicators, the, the, the framework that are missing, and what are the, who are the stakeholders we need to identify in order to collect that data? And then obviously the third step is to collect that missing data, and that involves uh, most notably meeting with the multi-stakeholder advisory board because they are very diverse and they come from many different stakeholder groups, um, and arrange consultations with them. And there are some instances in certain indicators where you have to actually collect very targeted types of information. So as Kadima mentioned earlier, um, it could involve, for example, the Ministry of Women and Children. It could involve uh, the Data Protection Authority. So we target those stakeholders as well that may or may not be involved in the multi-stakeholder advisory board. The step after that is to streamline and unify all of the indicator data that's collected. And we do some sort of quality control on uh, the indicators and data collected because we want to make sure that it's um, in, 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 in the application process, that it's, it's understandable and comprehensible to anybody who reads the report. Um, next, we apply, that, we apply the data to the indicators in a more wholesome and holistic fashion. And it's also done in a one-by-one -one basis. So uh, you obviously go through every single data point and every single indicator. And then you start to work on specific sections of the report based on those indicators. Finally, you execute an analysis and you, you uh, solidify the application of all 109 core indicators. And if you have more than 109, that's also good. Uh, we try to get as many as possible, but what's most important is that we have the 109 at least to begin with as a foundational aspect of the assessment. Um, we finally arrive to and start to articulate conclusions, so such as what our colleagues presented earlier about recommendations. Then we prepare our first draft, and uh, we craft that in a very meticulous way. And importantly, too, we have to share it with the MAB, the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Board, so that they could uh, contribute to it and see what we're missing and, again, do more quality control. Finally, we finalize the report, and we edit it based on the comments of the MAB, and we submit it to the MAB for final validation. And then, hopefully, we'll have a full national assessment. Thank you, Wafe. So, as uh, Mrs. Wafe said, that the, the, the first step uh, in the process of the implementation of Internet Universality Indicators after establishment of the map is uh, data collection. This slide shows the state of the 109 indicators in Tunisia in this step. So, uh, regarding the first, the, we have actually 14 indicators that their availability is still unclear. This needs verification and further analysis prior to understand from where we will obtain these indicators. The, the state of these indicators will be more clear after the first map meeting, so we can uh, know if we, have, if we can complete or not these 14 indicators. 47 indicators are still not available. They are related on to to no technical aspect to the study, example, the relationship between internet accessibility or gender, etc. So we need a survey to understand or to have information about these indicators. Survey needs significant research and time to complete. So we have sometimes to we need some time to complete these indicators and to find an uh, answer for uh, all these indicators. About 44% of indicators are provided by the INTT. It's about 48 indicators. There are about, it was a, a, a technical indicators. It's about uh, penetration rate, laws, uh, accessibility to internet, rights of women and youth, etc. This is uh, the indicators that the INTT provides, and uh, they will be. Uh, uh, sure analyze it in the full report. INTT will work to obtain all the other uh, not available uh, indicators, mainly for the indicators for the communication sector about cyber security, about um, access to internet, etc. So, uh, slide. Yes. 
And I should mention that the UNESCO and uh, the research team is very lucky to be working with the ENTT because they've already had such a head start on so many of the data points, and they're also very cooperative and very timely in their responses um, and, and how they collaborate, especially with the legal research team as well. So we're very thankful for that. Um, I just wanted to quickly go to the next slide. Uh, here we go. So, and we can maybe divide up the challenges together because it is a, a big one. Yes. Yeah. So the next, the next uh, step uh, is after finding the research plan, we, we have to arrange consultative meetings. And um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this involves meeting with various different stakeholders because the, the Romex framework is very uh, thorough and holistic and it involves several aspects of the development of the internet. So as a result, we have to meet with, for example, the Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy, the e-government unit at the head of government, um, the Ministry of Women and Family Affairs, as I mentioned earlier, the Ministry of Interior for more delicate uh, matters like content takedowns, etc. We also have to meet with uh, non-governmental uh, stakeholders as well, such as the National Syndicate of Tunisian Journalists, SNGT, uh, also the Data Protection Authority, and many, many, many other stakeholders that I'm not mentioning today. That being said, there are several challenges. Um, I can start with the first two, and maybe uh, Kerima could do the last three. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges we've, we've encountered so far is that there, there are some indicators that deal with sensitive data. What do I mean by sensitive? It's data that, for example, touches on national security issues, uh, the interception of data, interception of information, content takedowns. The challenge with this is that it may not be directly or readily accessible for the research team for us to actually incorporate that. So an example of that, and I know the font is quite small, and my apologies, but an example is uh, the rights, uh, rights E 3.1 indicator, which is about the legal framework for the lawful interception of data, including independent oversight, transparency, and evidence concerning implementation by government and other competent authorities. Uh, that's, that today in Tunisia is not very clear. So that might take more time and it might take more direct collaboration with, for example, the Ministry of Interior or uh, the Agence Technique Tunisienne, which is a, a technical agency that deals with national security and, and, and the internet and technical matters. Uh, the second challenge is, as my colleague mentioned from Ghana, I think, is tardiness and delays and timelines. Um, Sometimes when you request data from specific stakeholders, whether they're governmental or from civil society or technical or academic, they unfortunately might not get back to you in a timely way. Um, whether that's good or bad, I mean, people have different timelines. It could be a little bit challenging to streamline all of those timelines together. And this obviously may lead to delays and subsequent extensions in the application of the indicator data. And then we have uh, three more challenges. So the third challenge is survey needs. So, you know, some indicators need survey to, that especially those on perception. For, uh, for example, we have here the perception of experience of the regulatory environment for business and ICTs by business, including internet enabled business. So, however, oftentimes these survey have not been yet existed. So we will do this uh, survey, and this will have we need more, a lot of time and a lot of research. So we, this is one of the challenges that we have. The one of the most important challenge is to policy in development. In fact, it's difficult to answer an indicator. For example, to the existence of cybersecurity strategy with multi-stakeholders involvement, which is consistent with international rights and enormous firely. Even if today we have recently adopted a cybersecurity national strategy, we haven't any idea about the development of this strategy or the application of this strategy in Tunisia. We'll have meeting with the responsible in this uh, cybersecurity strategy to have information about the involvement of the assessment of this strategy in Tunisia. The last but not the least of these challenges are evidence of effectiveness. You know, in fact, we face this in the, um, in fact, of time, evidence of effectiveness needs a lot more data. For example, 
if we take the search effectiveness implemented. So we haven't any information. Today we have search in Tunisia. This, this search is implemented in Tunisia since 2004 by the law. And now we have, uh, recently we have a ministerial order on 1st October 2019, and they make a condition how to, make, to, applicate, or to apply this uh, search. So we have, we need more data and we need more time to know yes or not if this search is effectiveness, uh, the, to know the evidence of effectiveness of this search in Tunisia. So as you like for all these challenges, we need times to understand and to apply all these indicators. Okay. And I think the most important thing to remember here in the challenges is, as, as Karima said, I think in Tunisia specifically, there is a lot of goodwill and a lot of voluntariness to la volonté to actually do things and to, to provide information. But sometimes, like as in the case of the CERT, the CERT has existed for a long time, but there may not be uh, auto, auto evaluations of the effectiveness of the CERT or, or internal quality control of how effective it is. And so for us, it's, it's a bit challenging. Either we have to create a survey and work with the CERT to do that, to, to, de to determine and to, de to understand how effective it is, or we have to find another way. I mean, if, if we want to do the national assessment in a, in a deep, profound, and meaningful way, it's, 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 not, it's not ideal to just do desk research and, and get data that you, you're not sure is actually accurate. You, and so as a result, almost every indicator, you need to work with a different stakeholder. And that involves meetings and timelines and, and discussion and surveys, et cetera. So, it's not an easy process if you want to do it properly. And Tunisia is, is a country currently still in transition. It's in a democratic transition, which means, yes, there is a lot of willingness, but it's still a little messy and bureaucratic. So it does take some time. Um, I don't know how we are on time, but we just have one more slide left. Uh, and just a quick one for uh, the next steps. So most urgently, we have to meet with the MAB. I mean, we have to meet with the multi-stakeholder advisory board and share the missing indicator data. So all of the gaps that we identified in the research plan, first things first, we have to share it with the MAB and ask them, do you have any of this data that we could use? I think from my uh, prediction, it'll probably cut down the missing data by almost half. Uh, second step is to arrange consultative meetings with various entities to collect that missing data after the, the MAB meeting. So whatever is left. And then finally, start the analysis and finalize the draft with the community va validation and meetings. So um, we want to be as efficient as possible and as quick as possible, but it is a very important process and we're very excited about finalizing it hopefully soon. Um, merci. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to get in touch with me and Karima later. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Karima. Thank you so much, Wafa. Yes, I think UNESCO is highly lucky to have been working with you and your team on this excellent initiative in Tunisia. I I'm really deeply impressed by this solid uh, and uh, serious approach in the methodology. Actually, it's my first time to see the, how this project rolled out uh, on ground, uh, like ever here. I'm sure you're also amazed. And also, I appreciate that uh, you show clearly how these two existing, I mean, the required uh, mechanism in the methodology, MAB and the research team, how they, how they should work together, how they can really benefit each other. So I, will, I wish that would be a very good example for other countries to refer to. Um, given the time uh, uh, restraint, I'm now introducing our, uh, our representative from uh, South Korea. In the case of South Korea, you know, um, since I've been managing this project, uh, I'm receiving the voluntary expression of interest from uh, a number of countries and uh, stakeholders. In the case, it's uh, our uh, delegation ambassador or governments. We also uh, we, 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 we work with them to start the process composing the MAB. In the case of the, we receiving the civil society interest, the academic interest, we also uh, become a facilitator to meet with the, uh, the country's ambassador delegation to put the different stakeholder in the country together to build up this MAB to create a consensus so as to kick off the project. So, so Ms. Kiyomi Oh, representing Open Net Korea, uh, floor's yours. I just like to ask you a quick question that why UNESCO uh, 
project of indicator in, in the universality interests you, why you think it's relevant to the context of South Korea, which I understand is already a very full-fledged internet uh, development country. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm start talking. Yeah, <laughs> so what we like about Internet Universality Indicator is it's focused on the positive impact on the Internet. So we at Open Net Korea believe in the civilizational significance of the inter Internet as a democratizing force, a development force, and an equalizing for us. When people are questioning internet's value with a fake news or hate speech further, uh, we point out the level of knowledge newly made available to people. So when people are challenging interne internet's value with the talk of data's sovereignty, uh, we point out the complex complexity of connections we have made across borders through the internet. Yeah, Korea is an interesting country. Yeah, Korea has high internet penetration rate of 90% compared to the world's average of uh, 48%. At the same time, Korea has the highest internet access uh, price among the OECD, among OECD countries, uh, eight times Paris, uh, four times LA and uh, New York City, and two times Singapore. How was uh, this made possible? Yeah, I think uh, that's why we need two indicators. Uh, Korea has very strongly organized a civil society that achieved a peaceful impeachment of the president, which means we have uh, sufficient freedom and civic space. But Korea is one of the most vigorous in prosecuting truth uh, defamation, which UN Human Rights Committee has recommended against on. Korea has uh, one of the strongest data protection law in the whole world, and yet still suffers high levels of function creep uh, built upon the singular national identification numbers, which has caused massive data breaches. Uh, it is uh, uh, these conflicting perceptions that have hampered our discourses on how to Better in uh, better the internet, and it is these quandaries uh, that we are hoping that internet universally uh, internet universality indicators which sh uh, will shed objective light on by comparing Korea's situation with other countries. Uh, fortunately, I think uh, that internet universality indicators will be the low-hanging fruit for Korea because there are already four papers uh, I believe uh, will cover uh, much ground in terms of raw data. Uh, the annual uh, National Internet Transparency Report put out by Korean University and me uh, will answer many questions posed by rights indicators. Uh, the biannual Open Government Partnership uh, Independent Assessment Report will respond to the openness indicators. Uh, the annual Internet Use White Paper published by Korea Internet Security Agency KISA will uh, correspond to much data asked for by uh, cross-cutting indica uh, indicators and access indicators. Uh, and the annual information white paper published by Korea National Informatization uh, Agency, KNIA, will have produced much data sought for by access indicators. What is sorely lacking is uh, the analysis on the multi-stakeholder indicators. And now uh, this will be a catch-22 because uh, many governments do not want to see bad scores on themselves and will want to do the self-assessment when they know the scores will be good. Uh, so be uh, before coming to Berlin, we discussed KISA and met with K. Nia and recommended that they join us here in the audience. 
I don't know whether they are here. Uh, Kisa folks have been uh, passionate and diligent in participation in IGF process, but the greater government as a whole has not used to it as a space for serious discussion on internet policies. So we hope that South Korea government conducts the indicators, which will become also a process to promote multi-stakeholderism. Uh, these, these indicators uh, are, are uh, related, I think uh, these uh, indicators are related to several sectors and various is issues. So after getting back to Korea, we try to convincing, uh, we try to convince relevant ministries. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as time is uh, still short, I'd like to move quickly to our colleague from Sud Sudan. You have a PPT with you. Um, Daniel, could you please? And uh, thank you very much again for uh, for coming to, ex to ex uh, share the interest from South Korea. We are really ready to follow up with you and also with other stakeholders in the country to to start a process and hopefully in the future. And uh, because now in the Asian Pacific, we are having a few countries ongoing. I believe that uh, your case will be very, very informative to the region and also to the other countries. Um, actually, for the, uh, for the Arab states country, in addition to Tunisia, uh, I'm pleased to inform that we are also deploying the assessment in another very important country, Sudan. I'm happy that my colleague, uh, Paul Hector, uh, the advisor uh, based in Cairo office, also covering the Sudan is uh, here. And Paul, are you ready to yes, talk now? Yes. You Thank please, you very much, Ziang yeah. Hong, and it's been a pleasure to be here listening to all of you. Uh, in Sudan, we haven't actually started work yet, so I'm going to be very short. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the characteristics of what's happening on the ground and some of the possibilities and potentialities that we see. So first of all, to sort of set the scene, uh, you know, let's, I, I just want to share a little bit about Sudan. So as you can see, it's probably the, it's, it is the third largest country in Africa and actually the 16th largest uh, country in the world. This is by area. It has a very large population, almost 42 million people. And today in this context where economies of scale, economies of scope are important, this of course, having a large population, this is an incredibly uh, important resource. Now, one of the things that you see in Sudan, which is very similar to many African countries, is, and you know, countries on the, on the African continent and also within Asia, is that we, there's a very large percentage of the population who live in rural areas. So we see something like 55% of the population. As, as, as you'll see later, this is a bit of a challenge. Um, unfortunately, just about 22% of rural homes have electricity. And so, of course, in a context where we're looking at moving towards the internet, and of course, for internet, we need power sources, that means that a lot of innovation is needed uh, in order to ensure that uh, persons, institutions, etc., have the means to power devices so that they can access. Uh, very encouragingly, 34% of homes do have access to the internet, which is really quite good uh, when we think of uh, countries on the level of, uh, of, uh, of Sudan. But very concerningly, especially when we think about the ability to use uh, internet to harness this resource, to create content, uh, quite troublingly, only about 53.5% of the population are literate. And this, just to, to, to put this in context, uh, we're talking about Sudan, a country which has almost 500 ethnic groups and almost as many dialects. So, you know, just sort of ex extrapolate this, uh, we, we, we have some challenges there. Uh, and for the past 20 years, as you, you, know, you, you probably know, there's been a lot of civil strife, and of course, this has meant interruptions to education for many persons and so on. So, you know, quite a challenging situation. At the same time, the internet presents many opportunities for Sudan. As I mentioned before, they have a population of almost 42 million persons. So it means that this is actually one of the largest internet markets in the Arab region. Uh, this is really important. And uh, as a result of this, there's, there's been a high level of telecom investment in the country. In fact, there are quite a number of private uh, uh, companies operating there. It's a very competitive environment. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about the infrastructure. 
Sudan, has a, Sudan borders the Red Sea, and on the Red Sea border, there are actually two submarine cable landing points. And you have a fiber optic cable being spread out through the country and uh, fixed uh, wireless internet in many areas. So this is, this is something very, po po uh, very powerful. <clears throat> we, Sudan also stands to uh, reap the digital dividend. The, immediate, the median age of the population is just 18.9 years. So when we think about uh, you know, looking, looking forward, projecting forward a few years, thinking about having a, a, pop, a workforce which, uh, can, which is very productive. Now, if you can just uh, address that problem of literacy and educational capacity, uh, this is really something which is very, very rich and very interesting. And there's a lot of interest from the government in, of course, using uh, ICTs to support education of its uh, population. Many people don't know this, but uh, Sudan has lots of wildlife lots of cultural sites. And if, as we think about the internet, one of the big challenges, how do we get local content? How do we get content which is uh, important, which is relevant, which can be linked to economic activities to create well-being for persons? And so that's another opportunity. Many of you would, realize, would remember that uh, several years ago, South Sudan uh, separated from Sudan. And what happened was that about 80% of the petro, petro resources of Sudan, uh, you know, they, they, they disappeared. They, they, were, uh, they were no part of another country. And so the country urgently needs alternative economic uh, engines to boost its growth. And so internet economies, inter, uh, digital uh, related uh, industries are uh, very, very important. And, uh, and also talking about new developments. Recently, there's been a change in the government. Uh, there are no new political dynamics, priorities. There is the potential of many sanctions being removed, which of course will, uh, I think, pave the way for a lot of investments and other uh, initiatives, which will, of course, benefit the whole country on social and economic levels. So just to tell you a little bit about this increasingly enabling environment that we're seeing unfolding in Sudan, uh, already the government is, is involved in a number of policy reforms, and quite uh, positively, many of these reforms have been broad-based in terms of the consulta consultative processes and the engagements of uh, large numbers of different stakeholders. And here I've just thrown up about four of these. Uh, there's an ICT accessibility policy. Again, of course, in a country where there's been civil strife, of course, uh, persons with disabilities, this is one of the collateral impacts of, and the government has been uh, taking uh, vigorous efforts to look at how ICT can address the, names, the needs of these persons. I talked earlier about the literacy challenge and the fact that the country has a digital dividend which it needs to reap, a uh, very young uh, population. Uh, <clears throat> there's a smart learning policy review which has been undertaken by UNESCO and ITU, and again, tremendous interest uh, from in, in this area. Community radio is also very important, especially for the rural communities. I mentioned the fact that uh, power is a challenge. Uh, however, you know, radio, this is something which uh, provides the possibility of bringing to rural communities in their own languages uh, important development information, and of course, as far as the media development indicators and training, especially of female journalists, this is something which the government has been actively engaged in. So I think you see that we have a sort of a, uh, a, a very receptive uh, platform, very receptive uh, country to uh, work with in terms of uh, advancing on the implementation of these uh, Romex indicators. And well, already uh, for me today, I think I've already learned quite a lot from uh, the interventions by various persons. And of course, I'll be taking a lot of this into account in terms of adapting this to the Sudanese context. Uh, and, and really, I, I see everyone here as a, as, 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 as a very important resource for the work that we're doing. And I think we should think about having some sort of community of practice where we can uh, keep in touch on a regular basis, sharing experiences. Uh, in terms of what we're going to do going forwards uh, in 2020, we've already uh, received some, some funding, so we have some funding earmarked. Uh, that's, that's really po positive. Uh, we've already started reaching out to the government, uh, various partners and stakeholders in the country, and so we will be sharing what has happened here and continuing to build awareness and support among the key uh, advocates and champions in Sudan. Um, as 
indicated in the, the, the process, uh, this will form the basis for establishing a broad-based advisory group. And I mentioned earlier various initiatives uh, that, that have been undertaken, the ICT accessibility work, uh, the work around community radio, et cetera. Again, we will draw on these various communities to help shape this uh, body which can be representative and uh, you know, ensure that all the key voices, all the different divergent opinions are brought to, uh, to bear on this. And then, of course, we launched the, the call for research proposals. And that's the end. Thank you very much. Uh, thank look you. forward thank to your you. questions. Thank you for, for, for your uh, very useful uh, presentation. As you said, this meeting is exactly to share the practice, challenges, lessons learned from all the countries. Because all these, uh, about 20 countries, we are at a different stages. Some like Brazil, like Benin, they have done the whole process. Some are just in, in the middle, some are just uh, at the stage of kicking off. And also, like we have more countries like South Korea, they have the interest, they want to start to consider it. Um, just if you allow me, Guilherme, because now we are uh, going to start the Latin America regional session with, with, with four very solid presentations. Um, in, in a minute, I just like to uh, share the updates from two other Asian Pacific countries because we also have a project in, uh, in Thailand which has been running for one year more uh, because our colleague and uh, research team couldn't make the trip to Berlin. So I just uh, present some updates. In Thailand, we did a pilot. Uh, uh, indicator assessment uh, last year and then after the indicator were endorsed by the IPDC Council so we scale up to a, uh, to a official assessment uh, using the core 109 indicators and uh, I found this process quite difficult. The challenges is, uh, first, it's like the same question uh, raised by the participant who wrote me, how deal with the challenge in the research process lacking of the government participation? Because we didn't involve the government in the beginning, because at the time we did an academic uh, pilot assessment one year ago. So now we start to create a multi-stakeholder advisory board. We are starting to consult with all the governments, all the private sector, techies in the country. Then we found it's not that uh, straightforward. It takes more time than expected to create this form. You need to tell the whole story to brief. And um, sometimes there are some different uh, thoughts and about the methodology. So uh, we are still in this process. We are having this MAB in ship and then and the second challenge is research, because in a pilot uh, study, we did it uh, in a very, in two months, you know, two months research. So it was done in a history. The data collection was not solid. And also the expertise of the research team was not uh, inclusive. For example, Romex, we need really at least uh, the experts who is good at uh, uh, human rights, human rights expert, and who understand the open policies, inter or access policies. They, they, they very often they are from different fields. And also multi-stakeholder participation is a new concept for many countries. That's why we also, uh, we channeled in the international expert to be, to joining this research team who know better about the international concept, uh, discussion about the multi-stakeholder participation, and also cross-cutting, there are also many other uh, edge-cutting indicators, gender equality in many countries. There are no so many uh, disaggregated or aggregated gender uh, data. You have access to the entire population, but when you go to the age, gender, and in terms of usage, it's, it's really not uh, evident. So that's for the Thailand. Now we are improving the report and uh, the process going uh, going well. I think the final report will be published uh, early next year or in the middle. And then in the case of um, Nepal, we just received a letter from the Minister of ICT in the country. They are very enthusiastic to do this assessment. They want to be uh, one of the Asian countries to do this 109 core indicator assessment. So we are at a stage to compose the MAB to commission the research team. So I stop here.
Now I'm really uh, pleased to announce that uh, we, now we can go to the uh, next uh, regional panel uh, country assessment in Latin America. I particularly want to thank all the strong support from my colleague uh, Guilherme from the very beginning, uh, six years ago, uh, before the indicator in the air. I mean, he had this excellent idea to operationalize the universality zone principle into indicator. That's really his idea. Eventually, we uh, jointly uh, operationalized into the product today. And also, I thank you to Cedric Dr. BR. Also, since the very, very beginning, you are our soulmate partner. You have <laughs> advanced everything before we had put this on paper. The pilot study in Brazil is almost uh, a full assessment, and then you successfully put it in the uh, maybe consultation and uh, the, the, the perfect report, so it will be uh, firstly published. So now I hand over my floor to, to Guilherme. Now it's yours. Thank you, Shanghang. Hello again to all of you. Um, as you, let's ask uh, the wonderful technical crew to set the time for this next session, for the 45 minutes of this session. As you can see, we started with a 40-minute delay, but now we are just seven minutes delayed. So how we operationalize this magic, we cut Q&A, that means participation, which we don't recommend for your exercises with the Internet Universality Indicators that you do that. So keep engaging people, not the way we are doing here. Uh, and we cut coffee break. We, doubt, don't, uh, we also don't encourage that for when you are doing your validation processes with your remote stakeholder groups. Please keep their coffee break. It's very important. Uh, but here we need to finish at 1.30, so it's, we needed to take these drastic measures uh, to keep on time. Uh, as Chang Hong said, this session is about the assessments in Latin America. We will start with Brazil, which has a very interesting path on that. They started before this was going with the first consultation during Nat Mundial together with UNESCO. Then they did consultations to improve the tool then they did the first pilot in pre-testing, and then now they are applying the core indicators as they are going to explain. But we also will have the vice minister, as you already heard in the, more, in the beginning of this morning from Paraguay, Miguel Martin presenting the, the case of Paraguay. We will have um, uh, someone from the presidency of Uruguay via video because they had national elections yesterday, so she, they couldn't travel, but they sent a video explaining the process there. And we'll have the undersecretary from Ecuador. And we also, in, for your information in Latin America, we also have two countries that are uh, starting the process of assessment, uh, uh, Mexico and Panama which will make the region with at least six countries already very much involved in the process of assessments. Um, just a final word before handing the floor to, to Alexander and Fabio. One important thing in Latin American case was working together among those six countries. So actually we started the assessment process in the beginning of this, of this year with a joint training in CETIC's facilities in Sao Paulo, uh, with all the six countries involved being there. So it was interesting uh, starting the process with all the countries sharing their concerns and their doubts with the facilitators on how to implement the indicators. And perhaps this is also a good tip for other regions to exchange more on your challenges and doubts on how to apply the tool that we all saw. It's, very, it's a very complex tool and comprehensive. So we, we need to have these kind of exchanges to improve and make the assessment process smoother. So with that, I hand the floor to Brazil for their 10 minutes presentation. You have a timer there. Please don't go over the 10 minutes because then strange things start to happen if you, if you go through the 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guilherme. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you to share the Brazilian experience and the involvement of Nick.br in this whole process since the very early stages of the Brown framework. Well, uh, I will share my presentation with Guilherme, uh, sorry, with uh, Fabio Seni, also from Nick.br. 
And I think that Guilherme has already saved some time because he has already explained a little bit the process and also uh, David in the very beginning and Chan Hon. Uh, but I would like to, to say that uh, to Nick.br, it's an honor, to, honor to, to take part of this process since the very beginning because the principles of Rome X are very much aligned with our uh, principles for internet governance in Brazil. And I also would like to highlight and acknowledge the great work done by UNESCO in designing this framework and also uh, building a set of indicators to measure internet development uh, at country level. And I say that because uh, there is a growing consensus among UN agencies uh, and also other international organizations that internet and ICTs have become fundamental components in fostering human rights as well as crucial uh, driver for achieving uh, UN sustainable development goals. So all this undergoing uh, digital transformation has created a, a real demand for reliable instruments for data production that are able to measure the impacts of the internet. And I strongly believe that the ROMAX uh, frameworks is really an appropriated instrument to do that. Uh, with that, uh, just uh, for the sake of time, I will be very, very brief in this uh, initial uh, slides, and then I will give the floor to Fabio. But this is just to mention that um, the structure responsible for internet governance in Brazil is uh, composed by two, many, uh, two major uh, organizations, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, which is uh, a multi-stakeholder uh, internet governance in place in the country, uh, and the other side, the, um, we have the Brazilian Network, Network Information Center. The CGI.br is composed of uh, government, private sector, civil society organizations, and also academia. Uh, and I also, I also would like to highlight the fact that under NIC.br, we have uh, Registro.br, which is the Brazilian Internet uh, Domain Name Register Authority. And this is the only source uh, of revenue funding all NICS activities, including the activities of uh, CETIC.br, which is the data production center. Uh, and since 2012, we became a UNESCO category to center, um, working with a scope in Latin America countries and also uh, Portuguese speaking countries of Africa. Well, I also would like to mention that uh, Rome, why Rome framework is very much aligned with uh, our um, 10 principles for governance and use of the internet. In 2011, uh, CGI.br has established 10 principles that you, you can see uh, in, in this slide. Uh, and these are fundamental principles guiding CGI.br's actions and also they incorporate human rights dimensions into the uh, internet environment such as freedom of expression, privacy rights, democratic and collaborative governance, universality, diversity, among others. So that's why we, in the very beginning, uh, supported UNESCO because of this alignment between uh, what Rome is intended to and our uh, principles. Here, just uh, to highlight the fact that also in 2011, NIC.br and LACNIC and UNESCO uh, Montevideo office got together to discuss how to develop a framework that could go, that could go beyond uh, the media development indicators that already existed. But at that time, internet was not part of this uh, framework. So that's why we decided to fund the very first uh, policy paper to discuss this uh, framework. And as Guilherme has already mentioned, in 2014, during the internet, uh, the Net Mundial in Sao Paulo, we held the very first consultation of this uh, 
initial paper, including more than 30 NGOs and experts from Argentina, from Brazil, from Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Guatemala, United States, United Kingdom, and Uruguay. And here, also, I would like to highlight the fact that in 2015, when we had this very important conference in Paris, the Brazilian delegation had a very important um, action in terms of defining the need for measurement, how to measure internet development. And in the following years, uh, nic.br, through cetic.br, has translated all these guidelines into Portuguese and Spanish. This was a major contribution for the Latin America region. And now we are about to send to UNESCO the Portuguese version of this uh, guideline, the ROM uh, book. So we have already the Spanish version that was translated by UNESCO in Uruguay, and now uh, Nick.br has translated the Portuguese version of this manual. Well, uh, and more recently, uh, last year, as Guilherme has mentioned, we had also a, a final public consultation and a capacity building training in uh, Nick.br. And with that, I would like to give the floor to Fabio so that he can bring and share with you some of the principal uh, key results of the pilot that we conducted in Brazil. It is important to mention that we had collected data for the whole uh, core indicators in all the dimensions, but for the multi-stakeholder dimension, we collected all the whole set of indicators. Fabio, have the floor. Thank you, Alexandre. I have the very difficult task of presenting all those more than 100 indicators in four minutes, so I'm not going to do it. But overall, I would like to start by saying that as you go through the complex complexity of those indicators, you can see both quantitative and qualitative that we have a very heterogeneous figure in, in Brazil. So we have uh, we progressed very well in some areas, in some dimensions, and at the same time, we have huge challenges in specific areas. So this is important because with this data, we can not just uh, plan the strategies for the, the future, but also it's an indicator that policy matters. And when you have a specific condition and specific institutional conditions, you can uh, advance in, in those areas. So this is the case for the rights, which is the, is the very first dimension uh, where, where Brazil uh, has recently ended up approved a sound legal framework for this area, not, not just for protecting rights online, but also through other rights that are affected by digital society. So in 2011, the approval of the access of information uh, law, the civil rights framework for the internet approved in, in a very participatory manner in 2014, and recently the personal uh, data protection law approved in 2018. So uh, although we have a very sound regulatory framework, we still face challenges when it comes to the enforcement of those uh, legislations. So if you go to we, 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 the report presented, for instance, cases that we had removal of content or blo blocking of online applications made by judicial cases that uh, were considered by the expert interviewers uh, as non-aligned with the, the legislation. Uh, when it goes to openness, uh, we, we also have a regulatory framework for the internet that is in general conductive to innovative practices. So this allowed for the development of the network in the country, the emergence of a very strong market of internet service providers in, uh, throughout the, the, the Brazilian territory. And from the institutional perspective, there is also open government and open data policies in place. So we, we, we can say that this is already in place, but if you go, for instance, to the, to, the, to the chart, we can see that in terms of the use that, that citizens do uh, of e-government services, we are still, uh, they are still distributed in a, an equal way. So although 64% of internet users access uh, electronic services, uh, government of electronic services, this figure is lower in rural areas among women and individuals with low socioeconomic status. When it comes to accessibility, this, the scenario is, is the same. 
although Brazil has a very good, uh, the very first indicator of, of the, this framework is if the country has an ecosystem of measurement, and I do think in, in, this is the case of Brazil, so because of the work of CGI and NIC.br, and also our NSO and regulator, we are very, in a very good position of having data to updated in information and indicators to, to, to measure uh, digital aspects. At the same time, the use of internet is still unequally distributed. You, you can see that, for instance, we, the, the use is very, it's quite universal among people from high socioeconomic status and uh, achieve less than half of population from lower level socioeconomic status. Uh, both when it comes to access and, and uses of the internet, vulnerable populations such as living in rural areas uh, with low level of education are still uh, left behind in the country. So we have a very huge advancement, but at the same time, uh, problems to face. Of course, from, I'm, I'm not going to take some time on the multi-stakeholder perspective because we, we already discussed how the, the, the uh, CGI and, and all this multi-stakeholder experience is very innovative and, and worldwide recognized. And finally, from uh, the last uh, part of the, of, of the measurement, which is the cross-cutting issues, I would like to say that we are also, in, in, the, in the case, in a very well position in, in terms of having disaggregated data to inform policy uh, in the field. That's why Dorothy mentioned how, how we do have in Brazil very good data disaggregated by, by gender. Uh, as you can see, the chart, for instance, access to very sensitive content online among children from 11 to 17 years old varies a lot between, for instance, girls and boys which this type of evidence allows us for more focused policies to promote and protect uh, children's rights. So this is, again, the cover of the, the book that we are, we are we're planning to launch in a few days. So I hope you, you can go through this and, and see all the indicators. I, I, we won't have time to, to detail, but this is a very important contribution to, to the policies in the, in the country. So thank you. Uh, j just to complement that this book is going to, this publication is going to be available for download in about one week, according to our colleagues from UNESCO. Uh, it will be available in PDF format, so we can download. And this is the first UNESCO uh, report on Internet Universality Indicators. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, Fabio. A round of applause for the Brazilian presentation. While we set the PowerPoint for our, the presentation of Paraguay, just a few remarks. I think it's very interesting that the, the Internet Universality Indicators, as approved by the UNESCO member states, also help countries like Brazil to make this, ref, the, this reflection. Alexander started his presentation on how aligned a policy in a given country is with the overall set of indicators, as you, you said in the beginning. Also, it's interesting to, to, to see that the, the, the application of the indicators shows uh, the heterogeneous landscape we can find in a given country, but also underlining the inequalities we can find. Let's not forget that the key mantra for the 2030 agenda is leaving no one behind. So one of the issues of the indicators is precisely to help countries to identify those inequalities and how to solve them through the recommendations. Uh, and also even, in, and I will finalize with that, even in a country that uh, has a long history of producing internet indicators, precisely because of the existence of CETIC.br, you also found some areas like people with disabilities that data is missing. Uh, and in this, the, f the fact that data is missing, it's a problem for the applying the indicators, but also is a result of this application, showing clearly which data still needs to be collected for this kind of improvement in an evidence-based policies. So thank you very much. And now the floor is with the Vice Minister of Paraguay for his 10 minutes presentation. You have the floor, Vice Minister. Okay, thank you very much. As I said again uh, before, we are watching very closely what our, our neighbors are doing, so we will be very glad to read your PDF next week. And as, as, a con, as, um, as Paraguay is now um, being participating in, of this 
uh, invitation. We are very glad of being here, and we will tell you our uh, point of view of what we're doing, started doing with the help of UNESCO and an, an NGO. The investigation process starting, uh, started with uh, the hiring of a consultant, and then the research team was composed for five people. We got help from the UNESCO of one person who was tutoring the whole process. We consulted 24 people, experts, Paraguayan, all of them. We, valid we validated with nine people internationally, and uh, now our presentation is here at the IGF, so next step we will socialize it in Paraguay with all the members of the multi-stakeholder holder that we want to wanna do. Next is here. Okay. The methodology and the, of the indicators we prepare between the months of April and October and the report contains 110 basic indicators and two general indicators suggested within the eval evaluation. The methodologies were, uh, most of them were face-to-face -face meetings, video calls, and the specific emails that we were uh, working with the 23 consultants. The relevant information is uh, we have made significant efforts, we've been, been making significant efforts in the field of public policy. As I told you before, we have a new Ministry of Technology and Communication, which can work to have just one policy um, of open government, open data, access to public information. This is the first time our country is going to uh, work on these issues. There are inquiries in relation to the conditions of use and appropriation of ICTs, which can be marked as one of the most critical national problems of our internet development. We also have uh, big issues on connectivity since we are a landlocked country and uh, we have to make um, efforts for this infrastructure, although we have um, very good connectivity for mobile devices and internet, even in rural areas. But this is still a big challenge for access. Rights, Paraguay has a solid regulatory framework for human rights, um, such as the right privacy, freedom of expression, access to public information since 2014. This is being used very well in our country and we're still making efforts to um, um, some improvements for this regulatory framework. What stands out is the harmonization between public norms of the international rights and the human rights and the 1999 national constitution. There's no explicit regulation. This is some, something new with, that we found right now. There is no explicit regulation that states that the same rights apply to the online environments. However, in practice, the judiciary extends, extends it to the online environment. This is an issue we have to cover. The openness, we, the regulatory frameworks on telecommunications are known by the telecommunications sector, but consider administrative processes bureaucratic and limit investments and creation in technology, digital and technology companies. There is a significant increase in connectivity from Paraguayan citizens and pri private sector that invest in technology so that it could be more accessible. So I told you most of our, our telcos are investing in mobile, but not uh, um, bandwidth for houses and other uh, vulnerable areas in the whole country. Multi-stake participation, this is a something we are, we are requiring help from the ICANN and now UNESCO, we are also uh, um, trying to ask for everyone to help us on how this participation process can be built. We as a government know our position in this uh, process. As I, as, as I said before, we don't want to be the one who just writes the policy and then it has to be, um, has to be respected or, or, uh, or um, 
respected or uh, yeah it's, we, we have to build it together we know that we started calling everyone we all of them are participating are participating here at the IGF there are important challenges for the state when it comes to establishing the establishment of working groups that meet multi-stakeholder standards especially in processes such as the digital agenda and the national cybersecurity plan which now that we have a ministry we started building one together and is uh, and also as a ministry we can make all the other uh, ministries to uh, respect this uh, what we cover in the national cybersecurity plan also everything we come out in the internet governance forum in paraguay which is now uh, led by the internet society paraguay isoc paraguay and it's a, it's a space that was born in 2014, although it didn't work closely with the government. This is the first time we're working together. And this is something new also. As a cross causing issues, although the internet opens up in new possibilities for participation, emancipation and promotion of human rights, new types of human rights violation also find fertile ground in the digital environment. There are being uh, very many cases of fake news which are affecting also the the rights and we also want to know how to uh, endorse these problems in our country in relation to sustainable development and ethical and legal aspects the lack of, of adequate monitoring me mechanisms for projects related to the use of internet and ict this is an issue i've seen and i've heard everyone else has uh, on data collection we need to know better how to do it all together with this multi-stake pro process and general recommendations we find out that we have to consolidate and develop the national multi-stakeholder governance model expanding the participation of various sectors in forums and organizations related to the internet governance and telecommunications policy and regulations in Paraguay. Uh, before we came here, uh, as I said before too, 10, 10 participants are now in Paraguay, congressmen uh, from civil society and the government, myself, and we were building a table, round table all together where we talked about how we can uh, make or consolidate this national multi-stakeholder uh, um, uh, regarding to obviously the Romex um, indicators that we are working with UNESCO. Record and publish quantitative and qualitative data on the participation of different sectors. This is something that we want to do all together because sometimes, sometimes isolated invitations were held and the participations too. We need to consolidate all those and uh, put in one just policy uh, work together that we're doing. As a state, we have to create a personal data protection law, which we still don't have, but this will be a very, something very new, that an outcome very new for us, that the law is, is not going to be made just by the congressmen themselves, but we are working together and this will be one of the things that this multi-stake uh, holder um, table, round table, will um, probably have next year in the Congress uh, to present the law for the first time. And we have to strengthen the, and the open and electronic government. Now we are making good, very good efforts to have our e-government solutions for the first 10 services, digital services for the citizens. We have money for that. As I said also before, we have $130 million to start next year implementing in e-government um, um, policies, pro projects. And this also is the first time and historically to start in Paraguay. The Ministry of Technology is in charge of all this. Gen generate more meaningfully data collection on access and use of ICTs based on human rights and gender and, exp and expand and improve policies for the preservation of promotion of cultural heritage online. For the private sector, now that we're working together, we ask them, ask them for more transparency and accountability on governmental or judicial data on access, 
request and data blocking, since we want to all collect data together. Ensure full accessibility of private portals and applications for people with disabilities with a special attention to public services providers. This is something new we're doing with uh, the e-government um, direction. Actively, actively participate in the multi-stakeholder working group on technology and internet. For the civil society, we ask them to monitor and systematize the processes of violation on rights, especially the rights of freedom of expression before blockades of intermediaries, the right to, to privacy in cases of violation of internet communications and abuses committed against children and women, as well as accessibility for people with disabilities in public and private websites and applications. Since we as a state didn't work with this, they are working a lot better and we're using their information for this. Periodically to monitor and report on violations of net neutrality through the evaluation of citizens of their uh, together. The academy is also working together with us. Uh, most of it is to build uh, new curricula and activities related to internet governance since in Paraguay we're not all talking about this and we are we want to build new programs uh, related to all these um, new issues so thank you very much we're glad to be invited as I told you there are very um, good uh, challenges that we have identified thanks to this and now we are also asking for your help to know how to participate better in this multi-stake process thank you thank you vice minister so while we have the video from our colleagues from uruguay uh, just two brief comments um one I, if you allow me, Vice Minister, will share a backstage conversation when we started this process last year. Uh, the, the Minister of uh, ICTs was about to be approved by the Paraguayan Congress, this new structure, and uh, your team and the team of the Minister said, exactly. we want to apply the Internet Universality Indicators because this will help us in establishing a new ministry to know the way forward. And I do think this is part of what we want as UNESCO, those in internet universality indicators, to be a useful tool for the policy makers and decision makers in this process of implementing new policies. And uh, if we can have for next IGF uh, Paraguay saying that you improved your multi-stakeholder process and also approved your national data protection law, it will be a good, interesting result of the application of these indicators in, in this case. So thank you very much. And now the video from our colleagues from Uruguay, please. Hello everyone, I'm Camila from the e-government and information society agency from Presidency of Uruguay. Unfortunately, we couldn't be here today because we are having presidential elections in Uruguay. However, uh, our team is coming tomorrow, so you can reach us if you have any questions. Now we are going to present you the video with main results of UNESCO Internet Universality Indicators. To begin, we select some indicators to describe our country. Uruguay is a high-income economy with low percentages of poverty and inequality, as well as an above HDA average. When compared to other countries in the region, Uruguay stands out for its political, social and economic indicators. Uruguay is also the most advanced full democracy in Latin America and Caribbean, with very high levels of transparency to vote. As for its digital ecosystem, Uruguay has had for the past 15 years a holistic digital policy under the guiding principle digital transformation with equality. Four digital agendas have been redacted in order to unify and guide initiatives for the advancement on the digital transformation of the state at national level. It also has the Digital Government Plan 2020, which intends to further advance the integral transformation of the Uruguayan government into a digital one, making use of the opportunities offered by technology, strengthening the ties between state and citizens, and encouraging the intensive use of internet, mobile device, and shared platforms and data as a part of this change. 
Uruguay is in the lead at international rankings and is one of the most digitally developed countries, member of digital nations. After the original event of UNESCO Internet Universal Indicators held in Sao Paulo, AGESIC started coordinating implementation process in Uruguay. The national process took place in Uruguay between May and November 2019. According to the research methodology, the first step was the creation of a research team with a multisectoral advisory group, which articulated the process of consultation with multiple actors and gathering of information in different sources. The research group decided to report 130 indicators, which include 109 fundamental indicators and the contextual indicators. To this end, the research group conduct 10 face-to-face -face interviews and consult over 40 secondary sources. As a result, it was possible to gather relevant information on all the selected indicators. Once the collection process ends, the research group made the decision to categorize the level of progress on each indicator using a traffic light scale. After that, a validation process was organized to guarantee the quality of the data throughout a national workshop which include 16 institutional actors from the public and private sector, the academy and the civil society. The participating institutions review and analyze the first draft of Eurowise indicators. They validate around 100 indicators and conclude that the new actors should be included. As a result of the implementation process, there was a consensus among all actors on the outstanding and homogeneous performance of the country in all dimensions. Uruguay is very well positioned and made very positive advances in all dimensions studied. Most of the dimensions are in green, which denotes a positive result, identifying for accessibility dimension some aspects to improve related to the measurement of perception of different sectors on implemented digital policy. Now we are going to show the results obtained for each dimension. The consolidation of this regulatory framework allowed not only to make the country's digital expansion process viable, but also to channel the demands of the civil society. For example, laws of access to public information and the protection of personal data. One of the main challenges faced during the process was the balance between transparency and privacy. In this sense, in 2008, the government passed two laws that were paramount to reach it, the previously mentioned laws of access to public information and data protection. Uruguay has a mature and updated normative basis that meets the most demanding international standards in most relevant dimensions. The challenge in this dimension is the improvement of the implementation of the regulatory framework and effectiveness. Regarding the openness principle, Uruguay has endorsed since 2010 an open data policy at the national level promoting the development of national infrastructure and enabling a reference framework for the use and appropriation of open data. This policy has been established in multiple commitments of the country's digital policy through the different digital agendas and in the open government strategy. As an example of this, it is relevant to mention the existence of a national open data catalog through which anyone can access to more than 2,000 data sets and applications developed by the public and private sector, the academy and civil society organizations. 100% of public institutions have a website. This year, more than 50% of public institutions are consolidated in a single unified portal for administration, which meets the standards and requirements of accessibility, usability and mobility, in accordance with good international practices. The existence of digital educational resources open to all levels of education. In terms of access, the digital agenda and national statistics shows a sustained evolution of access and use of the internet, internet digital devices. In this sense, the country has shown an important closing of the digital divide by sex, age, and income groups. Since its beginning in 2007, Uruguay's digital policy has been multi-stakeholder. Different national and international workspaces have been built with the participation of public and private sector, the academy, and civil society. For example, a national IGF, a honorary advisory council of the information society, a security of information council, a national digital agenda, and developed tools for e-participation. In this dimension, we can see a great advance for the country with the challenge of strengthening the strategy of multi-stakeholder participation. 
In conclusion, Uruguay has a mature national statistical system with a specific studies on ICT and a mature sectorial statistic ecosystem. Furthermore, Uruguay's National Household Survey contains a set of questions of the use of ICT. And since 2010, the National Bureau of Statistics implements a specific survey for the sector together in cooperation with HACASIC. Although no gaps have been detected in study dimensions, the challenges are related to improving the indicators through a more specific research design of the sector and promoting impact studies in social, economic, educational and development dimensions. In the next steps to follow, AGESIC will prepare a preliminary report where the information obtained by the relevant indicators will be analyzed, including some recommendations. This process has been incredibly valuable for Uruguay, so we are thankful for being part of it. Thank you very much for your attention and we wish you a great event. So, thanks for the Uruguayan presentation. As she said in the beginning, the Uruguayan team is flying to Berlin today because they had national elections yesterday in the country. So if anyone Hello has everyone, I'm Camila and, from and uh, comments to the Uruguayan process, you can reach the AGESIC team that will be here uh, by tomorrow. We are now setting the presentation for Ecuador and uh, just a brief comment on the Uruguayan case. Um, it's very interesting that they have an agency attach it to the presidents of the republic it's actually called the agents for information and knowledge societies and of course this made the process easier in terms of data gathering because they could ask all the governmental bodies in uruguay from the presidency to fulfill the different areas of the internet universality indicators and of course coming from the presidency as they they told us helped a lot although they they also needed to count on universities and and civil society groups to produce this but uh, i guess that uruguayan case is one uh, of course it's a country with three million people so it's a very specific size when compared to brazil or colombia or mexico or other big countries but uh, if you want to hear, hear more about their experience, they will be here tomorrow. So now uh, I will hand the floor to the Under Secretary from the Ministry of Technology in Ecuador for her presentation. I understand she will speak in Spanish, but the presentation is in English. So uh, I will do uh, a, a translation when I feel that you can't follow through the slide. So I don't need to interrupt her a lot while she is speaking. Uh, entonces, por favor, eh, su secretaria okay. tiene el piso por 10 minutos. Gracias. Okay. Good morning. Um, Ecuador en julio del 2019 presentó su política Ecuador Digital. Eh, where is the... Ah, ok. Sorry. Oh, thank you. En el mes de julio del año 2019, Ecuador presentó su política Ecuador Digital. Uh, esos son los tres ejes en los que estamos trabajando y esas son las metas hasta el 2020. 98% del Ecuador conectado en servicios de telecomunicaciones Ecuador eficiente y ciberseguro, esperamos el 80% de los trámites de gobierno en línea hasta el 2021 y el Ecuador innovador y competitivo es la Agenda Nacional de Transformación Digital. So very briefly, those are the three axes of the digital policy and those numbers are the goals towards 2021. It's okay. Um, Estos son los antecedentes y quizás habría que traducir. Eh, cinco de cada diez personas accede a 4G. Five out of ten people has access to 4G. Cuatro de diez tienen internet en sus hogares. Four out of ten has a home internet. Cuatro de diez tienen smartphones. Four out of ten smartphones. Uno de diez computadores portátiles. One in ten laptops or portable computers. Um, 874 parroquias actualmente no tienen cobertura 4G. 874 kind of municipalities don't have uh, 4G coverage. 
que hemos cumplido. Eh, fibra óptica de la empresa Selec, donde haya luz, hay internet. Es lo que ahora tenemos. Donde hay luz va a llegar el internet. So what they have already accomplished, where there is electricity, they will have fiber optics. Los smartphones y tabletas ahora ya no tienen aranceles. Hasta el año pasado, hasta, hasta octubre, tenían aranceles del 15% más. So they cut taxes for buying uh, laptops and tablets. Ahora tenemos compartición de infraestructura entre las telefónicas. Es decir que entre las tres telefónicas que hay en Ecuador se van a compartir la infraestructura y no centralizar para poder llegar a las zonas rurales. Three major mm. telecom companies in Ecuador now will share their infrastructure mm. for reaching rural areas, which they are not doing before this change in the policy. Con esto tenemos el internet del 50% más económico. So with this, they has uh, able to re to reduce the cost of internet in 50%. 500 parroquias conectadas. And now they have 500 municipality connected. Y la penetración de los cell phones va a ser del 42 al 67%. And uh, cell phones penetration will go from 42 to 60 plus percent. Se han planteado reformas a la ley de telecomunicaciones y también se entregó a la asamblea la ley de la política de datos. They are changing the telecommunications law and they delivered to the National Congress uh, a draft bill on the data protection law. Esperamos bajar a 4,300 trámites en línea. Eh, vamos a tener cédulas online eh, y pasaportes biométricos y a presentar la estrategia de ciberseguridad. So they are improving different uh, online, uh, uh, different online services. Um, and the last point mm -hmm. was... Cybersecurity cyber security. law, and they are discussing a cybersecurity law. Okay. Um, en el, los proyectos que están son gobierno en línea, telemedicina y educación virtual. Online government, telemedicine, and virtual education are part of the policies they are uh, discussing and implementing. El resultado final de esta estrategia será un Ecuador inclusivo con desarrollo, cerrando la brecha digital social. So a more inclusive Ecuador, uh, closing the digital bridge, the digital gap, and with more social inclusion and, and development. Eso como un antecedente del país. This is the background of the country. Okay. Um, en, en Ecuador, en relación a los indicadores de la universalidad del Internet, se han tomado los 21 indicadores contextuales. Eh, en los indicadores de acceso, 34 de los 70. En los de derecho, 20 de los 55. En los indicadores de participación múltiple, 12 de 21. En los indicadores de apertura, 17 de 58. Y en los transversales, eh, 26 de 79. Lo que implican 130 indicadores con los que estamos con los, con los que se ha hecho el estudio. En los indicadores contextuales, como ustedes pueden ver, eh, la aplicación de los 130 ha generado un documento extenso y en esta presentación se tomarán unos de los indicadores a manera de ejemplo. 10.141 es la renta nacional bruta per cápita con una desaceleración en su crecimiento en relación a los, a los años pasados. En el, en el índice del desarrollo humano, el porcentaje es de 0.75 puntos por debajo de la media de América Latina y el Caribe, que es de 0.75, de los países de desarrollo humano alto de 0.75.7 puntos. El coeficiente de Gini es de 0.47 en el ámbito nacional, donde 45 es urbano, 44 es rural. El Duit Business está en 57.7 del ranking de 129. Y el índice de conectividad está en el ranking 82 
en el 2016. Eh, para mejorar es importante reforzar la independencia judicial, reducir el porcentaje de software pirata, mejorar la suscripción de telefonía móvil, la conexión a internet eh, y en general el, el entorno del negocio. So as you can see, I'm not translating because what she's saying is there in the, in the slides, the different indicators, in this case, the previous slide, the contextual indicators. Ok, en los indicadores de derecho, eh, el marco legal del Ecuador, la Constitución sí dispone de la aplicación directa e inmediata de los tratados internacionales de derechos humanos. Estos instrumentos internacionales se aplican para garantizar el goce de los derechos a los ciudadanos. La libertad de expresión en línea ha tenido avances en este nuevo gobierno, según cuenta la información emitida por la OEA en el 2019. En la vulneración de derechos de autor, el gobierno sí ha bloqueado el acceso a Internet en determinadas páginas, como en el caso de Roja Directa TV, eh, esta por, por llamar un poco a la, a, la, a la resistencia. El gobierno electrónico se, se han implementado políticas públicas entre las cuales se encuentra el plan de gobierno electrónico del 2018 al 2021 que busca la participación de los ciudadanos en las decisiones estatales. También se ha presentado el derecho a la protección de datos personales que se lo garantice en la Constitución y está a cargo de la DINARDAP. Um, el, el Sistema Integral de Tecnología es un claro ejemplo de que se incorporó en Ecuador el Internet en la educación. En relación a los indicadores de apertura, el Internet abierto de manera que todas las personas sean capaces de desarrollar o aprovechar sus recursos y oportunidades de la manera que mejor les parezca. Entonces, eh, la política de Ecuador Digital promueve la innovación. El fomento a las licencias abiertas se lo realiza a través del Código de la Economía y el Conocimiento y también promueve el desarrollo y el uso de fuente abierta. El Arcotel es la agencia de regulación de los proveedores de servicios. Esta regula desde el enfoque técnico. El fomento de los recursos educativos abiertos tiene una limitada promoción en Ecuador. Fundamentalmente, fundamentalmente se han desarrollado en las instituciones de educación superior. Los datos abiertos y gobierno abierto, el ministerio está trabajando en la co-creación de la Política Nacional de Datos Abiertos, cuyo... Just one small thing that she's mentioning what is there, but in specifically in the case of the open educational resources area, she was underlining that the, the assessment of the Internet Universality Educators showed that that is still lots of ground to be covered in Ecuador because right now the open education resources are being mostly applied in the tertiary education, but not in the other areas of the education system in the country. Ok. Um, y en la accesibilidad de los datos, eh, el principio de accesibilidad para todos posee aspectos técnicos, económicos y sociales y va más allá de la conectividad. En ese sentido, Ecuador cuenta con infocentros que facilitan el acceso universal y con ello la reducción de la brecha digital. Esta es una iniciativa que obedece a los planes de acceso universal de la Ley de Telecomunicaciones. En Ecuador, el 55.6% de la población utiliza Internet. El costo de un gigabyte es de promedio de 6.93 en un plan telefónico. Se espera una reducción como una consecuencia de las acciones enmarcadas en Ecuador Digital. En Ecuador, el 64.4% de la población urbana y un 37.9% de la población rural utilizan Internet, lo que evidencia una brecha digital en el uso del Internet. 
En Ecuador, 44,843 dominios están registrados con punto .es. Para dar una idea de los contenidos locales. Sin embargo, existen otros contenidos locales que no tienen este dominio, pero que no pueden ser mapeados. La Agenda de Educación Digital es una muestra de que el gobierno trabaja por brindar capacidad y competencia para lograr acceso eficiente a Internet. En la participación se evidencia que de que los compromisos internacionales, leyes nacionales, normativas, son previamente debatidos por actores involucrados. El Ecuador sí ha asumido formalmente los compromisos internacionales con la finalidad de impulsar el gobierno electrónico, el gobierno abierto. Un ejemplo es la Alianza para el Gobierno Abierto firmado en 2019. La Estrategia Nacional de Ciberseguridad, Estrategia Nacional de Comercio Electrónico, la propuesta de la política de datos abiertos han constituido aportes a la ciudadanía. Se involucra de forma activa a los grupos de actores en procesos participativos para la co-creación y construcción de políticas normativas y otros instrumentos en relación con el Internet, entendido en este amplio sentido de TIC. El Foro de Gobernanza de Internet en Ecuador tiene el aval de la ONU desde hace cinco años atrás. El gobierno también ha participado en la ICANN y la participación del gobierno anual no es sistematizada. Okay. Uh, y los indicadores finales eh, son cifras que ustedes las pueden ver. El 54.9% de mujeres usan Internet. El... Um, en la niñez, el 49.54% de niños y niñas entre 5 y 15 años tienen acceso y, el y en el desarrollo sustentable, el 61.4% de las compañías tiene presencia en la web. Entonces, sí. Thank you. Gracias, subsecretaria. Thank you very much. Uh, applause for this presentation as well. Thank you. As you could see, uh, just two quick remarks about Ecuador. I was very impressed by the amount of universities that were involved with the ministry in applying the indicators. Estaba diciendo que estaba muy impresionado con la cantidad de universidades que participaron del proceso de aplicación. Fueron como nueve, ¿verdad? Eh, sí, dos, cuatro, ya, yeah. sí, It's fueron nueve. Like nine universities in the country were involved together in the process of application of the indicators in Ecuador, which shows a very interesting process of involving the academic world in, in this uh, uh, very complex process of gathering information. But also the other element that also stands in, in the presentation is still the severest gaps Ecuador, as many other countries, has particularly the difference of access between urban and rural population in get access to internet. And again, this is a major issue for all of us, and we hope that the assessment in Ecuador can help the government in, in improving those gaps and, and solving uh, these uh, kind of issues with the new digital agenda. Uh, so, gracias, uh, su secretaria, okay. y, y ella estará acá también para, para las dudas. She will remain here for if you have any questions. So, with this, uh, we are concluding the Latin American country assessments. I will hand the floor back to my colleague, Shang Hong. Uh, but remember that we will have the photo at the end. So, please stand still for uh, the final sessions. Shang Hong, thank you very much. Thank you for offering such a wonderful trip to Latin America in terms of the IOI mix landscape. Um, <coughs> now we are going to Europe. <coughs> what is amazing about this indicator is that they are really uh, useful for every country, including our European countries, which are in a very developed stage in terms of internet access development and policy. Um, I'm very uh, grateful that uh, we have received uh, a number of expressions of interest uh, from European countries since last uh, November, and uh, so that's why we have uh, three uh, colleagues to here to present uh, the ongoing initiatives. May I check if uh, uh, Mr. Lucien Casto from France is? Uh, did he arrive? Yeah, you arrive on time, Monsieur. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> <coughs> 
So, so uh, no, I'm giving the floor to uh, our uh, dear partner, uh, Mr. Lucien Castro, representing uh, the president of the ISOC chapter in France, and also uh, he has a number a uh, number of other brilliant titles. Maybe you can briefly introduce yourself and also the the ongoing initiative in France. Thank you. Thank you, Xiaong. Um, indeed, I'm Lucien Castex. I'm Secretary General of the French chapter of the Internet Society. And I'm a researcher at Sorbonne Nouvelle University in, in Paris, and I've been appointed to the French Human Rights Commission. So we are uh, very grateful to participate, uh, obviously, in evaluating um, in France uh, the indicators. And, um, well, we are not as well advanced as uh, some of our colleagues. We are just starting the assessment. And, um, well, the, the quick uh, point I wanted to stress out in this uh, presentation is just what uh, process did we uh, follow uh, in assessing. So, first off, uh, we have an, an Internet Governance Forum, a French Internet Governance Forum with a multi-stakeholder committee organizing the forum each year uh, in July, early July. And uh, discussing with colleagues at UNESCO, we decided to basically to start there and to try implementing uh, the assessment through the French Internet Governance Forum, um, which is already a, a multi-stakeholder fora, and a number of partners obviously uh, agreed on it, and we are very delighted to be able to participate in the, in the evaluation. So, first off, obviously, the, the French chapter of the Internet Society is in for it, so the technical community will be participating. Um, we have participation from the French telecom regulator, the RCEP, which is basically specialized uh, in evaluating, assessing a number of technical aspects of the Internet, matching a number of the indicators uh, to assess, for example, internet coverage, uh, broadband, 4G, and so on, but also uh, IPv6 deployment uh, and the like. So, so RCEP, the, the French telecom regulator, is on board. Um, also, we went through civil society to try bringing think tanks and academia into the process. And we have participation from one of the leading think tanks in France as it concerns digital affairs, which is called Renaissance Numérique. And uh, they are participating also in the evaluation from a civil society and expert perspective. As uh, for bringing academia to the table, uh, the, the discussion is still ongoing. So um, I can just hint a bit that obviously Sorbonne Nouvelle University will be a part of it. Uh, as is the CNRS, the French National Research Centre, which just created a Centre for Internet and Society, a French iteration, which will be participating uh, from academia perspective to the evaluation. And uh, obviously, uh, also we went to government, which has a good support on evaluating also uh, the French situation, and we are partnering with the French Digital Council, which is uh, an independent body appointed by government, which specialises in uh, assessing and evaluating uh, digital affairs and counselling the state about it, and uh, which will be representing government in the in the process. So, well, very quickly, because I know the time is limited. Uh, basically, what we will do is, as we do for the Internet Governance Forum, is to gather all partners to date and build up an expert advisory committee so that we can assess the quality of the evaluation. Uh, we are, as we speak, uh, evaluating it and inviting people to join in as we want to evaluate in 2020. Uh, will be composed, obviously, in a multi-stakeholder fashion. Uh, about 20 people are, um, well, uh, have been contacted yet, and will be participating in the, evalu in the evaluation process. And uh, the second step will be to 
gather interviews to uh, our feedbacks from governments and a number of French agencies in charge, obviously, of digital affairs and internet in France. Uh, uh, very quickly, we have a, a DPA, a Protection Authority, um, which we will obviously uh, meet. We have a number of other uh, technical regulators uh, in charge of third part of regulating internet. Um, the judiciary also has a part in it, and there is a number of, uh, let's say, legal initiatives in play in France as we speak. Uh, one which is uh, interesting in the concern is um, a, a, a bill on regulating hate speech, uh, which is obviously uh, is a framework of regulating the broader internet. Uh, we have a couple legal initiatives which concern terrorism and one on fake news which went through Parliament last year. So we are still eval evaluating the process and we will obviously include that in our evaluation. So that's in a very few words what we could uh, present at this point and we're looking forward to collaborating obviously. Thank you. Thank you, Lucien. Thank you, friends, for taking such an uh, initiative. Um, I also like to share that uh, uh, we are collecting all the written uh, speaking notes, pre presentation, PPT, etc., from all the speakers from all countries. We will then uh, publish them on the UNESCO website with a new story, so you can download uh, each other's presentation. I mean, within. 24 hours, if everything can be received. Also, uh, tell us your uh, consent if you'd like to share with other colleagues because we receive a lot of requests to, to see it. Um, uh, now I'd like to introduce the next speaker uh, from Serbia, Mr. Danilo Krivo Kapik. I hope I pronounce your name properly, uh, representing uh, Share Foundation. I still remember the first email you sent to me uh, one year ago uh, after we launched the indicator implementation process. And then I found uh, we are really on the same page. But then there was lack of funding, and also we needed a multi stakeholder process in the place. Um, after one year, uh, then we connect you to the to the to our gov governmental partners in the in Serbia. We receive the interest from the OSCE mission in, in in Serbia. Eventually, everybody came in, and then. Uh, uh, all is solved and this funding secured the process in place. That's why I'm so happy to see you in person today. Thank you for your first email and as a, now floor is yours to share what is the, where I was standing in this initiative in Serbia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, uh, my name is Daniel Krivokapic and I'm coming from a uh, uh, Belgrade-based NGO Share Foundation uh, that is established uh, with goal for fighting for free and open internet and the implementation of uh, human rights in digital environment. So you can understand why this is an uh, important topic for us. Uh, I'm here today with my colleagues from uh, Balkan Investigative Reporting Network and OSC Mission to Serbia. And uh, these three organizations will coordinate uh, this process of implementing uh, UNESCO universality indicators in Serbia. Uh, and if I may say, I think it's uh, really good that it's, uh, uh, it's going to be implemented by these organizations. I believe that uh, uh, if the government would be the lead, there would be uh, some bias. And, uh, 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 but also, I have to say, we can also be biased, so this um, multi-stakeholder approach is really important. And uh, I will just briefly say where we are now. We are just at the very beginning. Uh, we uh, just, uh, just recently, we established the advisory board. And uh, I'm really happy with the uh, participation, I mean, with the members of this board. So we have um, members of uh, Ministry of Telecommunication, uh, Ministry of Culture, Statistical Office, Commissioner for Data Protection, but also uh, uh, people from academia, uh, from uh, UNDP, from other NGO, NGOs, but also uh, businesses. And uh, I'm uh, 
very happy that almost everybody that we invited to this adv advisory board accepted uh, th uh, this, and uh, everybody is uh, really excited to start with this research. Uh, the next step is um, to form the research team, with, uh, which will uh, happen uh, by the end of this year, and from the January we are expecting to start uh, with this research. And uh, for us, it's uh, really important to state that this is not uh, research pro just the research project for us. Uh, we see this as opportunity to form a, a forum a and a forum for dialogue between uh, different stakeholders, which, which is really important. Uh, I'm really glad that uh, we are here today. We heard a lot of um, ex uh, good experiences from uh, uh, different countries. Uh, it was really interesting to listen to the experience of Tunisia. I think we are in a really similar situation uh, at the moment, and uh, we will use this ex uh, their experience a lot. Um, uh, why, why is this? Why I believe this is important uh, for Serbia? These uh, indicators. If I, uh, I, we don't still don't have any findings because we are at the very beginning, but uh, my feeling is that uh, uh, there are no clear internet policies in Serbia. So, this is not like top priority for the government, and uh, it is both good and bad. I mean, it's. Uh, bad because the potential that the internet ha have is not used uh, incomplete, but on the other hand, uh, it is good because uh, uh, government is not interfering with the internet policy so much. The internet is much bigger than Serbia, and, uh, and in a way it is good while we don't have any kind of um, uh, uh, government uh, control of the internet. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, things are changing in the world, so uh, Freedom House report, Freedom of the Net, uh, uh, stated for the ninth consecutive year that there is a decrease of uh, internet freedoms in the world, and uh, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that this trend is going to continue. So uh, for us, it is important to, uh, to do this. Uh, to see where the Serbia is at the moment, and also to make uh, uh, good recommendations for government. So when they finally understand the importance of internet, so they don't uh, destroy it in Serbia. So uh, I think that's that's the most important thing. So I think that's enough for us for now. And thank you again for calling us. Thank you, Danilo. It's really, really inspiring and encouraging to hear what you have said. Now, our last speaker for the Europe uh, panel is Madame Anila Dimova uh, from Ministry of Transport, Information Technology and Communications of Bulgaria. Uh, I have met you since last uh, Eurodig, and uh, you impressed me such a wonderful advocate of a Romix uh, indicator framework. Thank you so much. So how is the discussion in your country going on? Could you please share it with us now? Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Anelia Dimova from the Ministry of Transport, Information Technology and Communications, Bulgaria. And uh, just we uh, talk with uh, Serbian colleague uh, Tanya Maksic about indicators because uh, soon we were uh, together at a project of BISER, uh, you know, compact project in Sofia. It was a, a workshop uh, and uh, there we discuss uh, uh, connected with, uh, uh, with uh, indicators, uh, uh, things, uh, um, cross-cutting things, uh, gender. Uh, I know that uh, uh, in the gender study of uh, Bissera's project, uh, UNESCO also uh, has uh, uh, an opinion and uh, uh, shared with uh, the project people. It is very interesting. Uh, in Bulgaria, my ministry uh, carries out uh, um, 
policy in electronic communications and information society. Uh, we have an, an IT directorate uh, with uh, around 10 uh, people. Uh, and uh, my department uh, for information society is the only by the time being uh, dealing with uh, uh, indicators case of UNESCO on the expert uh, level. Uh, what is uh, good news uh, uh, from November uh, when we uh, shared with uh, UNESCO uh, indicators case. Uh, the, new, the news is uh, that uh, we have uh, already uh, a public expert council uh, in the ministry on uh, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, principle uh, established with uh, colleagues from uh, business academy, uh, uh, non-governmental organization, many jurists, uh, and uh, state uh, authorities like uh, Ministry of uh, Education, uh, Social Policy, uh, the telecom regulator, uh, the agency uh, for electronic uh, governance, and etc. And now we uh, try to prepare a, a, a good material um, translated into Bulgarian uh, for the core indicators in order to, to try to, to share with this uh, public council uh, the idea uh, that we think is uh, very useful uh, um, it is interesting uh, here to, uh, to hear uh, uh, practice of uh, other uh, states uh, and uh, it uh, will be good to, to share. I hope uh, you, sh uh, you will share with us uh, this uh, uh, visions, experience, presentations and so on. Um, in order to help to, to composite uh, um, our plan to composite our to uh, to make uh, in more details uh, the the next uh, steps we we could uh, make. Uh, uh, it is not uh, um, not easy uh, because of. Uh, uh, for example, a national, our National Statistical Institute in Bulgaria, uh, there are m many indicators uh, concerning uh, infrastructure, concerning uh, uh, using uh, uh, of internet from households and uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, um, and so on. Uh, there, uh, there are uh, DESI indicators on uh, uh, European level, uh, uh, the indicators concerning uh, digital uh, economy and society uh, composite uh, index. Uh, um, there are indicators on uh, connectivity, uh, human capital, uh, electronic governance, uh, uh, open data uh, and uh, so many things uh, uh, that uh, uh, men could say uh, is overlapping with uh, uh, with all indicators we know we all know that uh, there are uh, many many set of indicators uh, of uh, international organization uh, but uh, because of uh, we know uh, in details the process of uh, um, formulating this uh, UNESCO universality indicators uh, uh, because of our participation at the different stages of uh, development, uh, um, our ministry and I think uh, other uh, uh, sources of uh, uh, in the state uh, uh, 
um, we have uh, had uh, a compilation of uh, uh, opinions from uh, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, organization uh, in order to uh, to prepare the, the opinion, uh, national opinion on uh, the development process of indicators. Um, and we, we know indicators and we think on expert level uh, that uh, it will be useful to use this indicator for indicators for uh, assessing, for evaluating uh, internet policy. Um, but uh, by the time being, that is uh, uh, what we uh, uh, did. Uh, we hope that the process uh, uh, will not stop and will continue. Thank you. Thank you. We heard, we heard you. I, I understand that uh, actually in every country it's not a straightforward process, but that's the beauty of the uh, process and also the value of the project, even to kick off this dialogue, it makes a lot of sense to the country's policy debates. Um, you know, we are really running quite uh, short of time. Uh, the last five, 30 minutes, we really want to give to give floor to everyone. And my colleague, uh, I hope my colleague Guilherme, the magical uh, moderator, will make the best of it so everybody can talk. And um, if you allow me, my last uh, word from the dis discussion is that um, uh, overlapping of the indicator, actually UNESCO indicators, um, we, we are not uh, reventing other wheels on the internet policy, but we are really uh, making a very comprehensive package of all the uh, necessary dimensions, uh, uh, cross-cutting um, ethical dimensions of AI, for example, is also there, and the, the gender and uh, multi stakeholder is also something really unique to this UNESCO indicator. That's why uh, we are recommending uh, all the countries do it, and also we are really uh, you, uh, do implementing in partnership with other organizations. Like for example, in Europe, the Council of Europe is really working closely with us because the Council of Europe is recommending its 47 member states to assess internet freedom indicators. We have checked, there are some uh, shared indicator in terms of human rights and access and then we also, if if a country like Austria, they have already done internet freedom assessment, they can make 50% more efforts to, to expand this assessment to do to measure a more open and a more multi-stakeholder uh, indicator. It will be a universality indicator. So we would be able to optimize the existing resource to make the best of the, 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 the results for every country. Um, before I go give floor to Guilherme, I just make, in, in case I will forget, I want to do an advertisement if you indulge me, because uh, we are uh, launching a new publication um, uh, on Wednesday. It will be the last, last slide. I almost forgot in my oh, Of course, please uh, remember uh, our website and um, uh, everything will be shared. A publication, our PPTs and updates uh, will be shared on that uh, indicator uh, website. And also for tomorrow, we are launching a new publication about um, translating Rome principles to govern the artificial intelligence. Yes, it's Wednesday. That's what I'm. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> And so it is Wednesday, you see, it's from 9.30 to 10.30. It exactly shows the, the, the vibrant of this framework. It's not only about the government internet, but also extending these four fundamental principles to inform the governance of artificial intelligence and other advanced ICTs. So I also invite you all of you to, to that session so we can discuss many uh, aspects at that event as well. Okay, Guilherme, okay, now floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you, Shang Hong. So after the break, the advertisement, uh, we'll have our last 30 minutes for um, this for this open discussion, but I will first invite three guests for uh, warming up the audience with this discussion. Antoine Vernier, the Mission Publique, Nigel Heikson, the, the, from ICAM, and Sadaf Khan from APC, 
I guess the three of you heard a lot uh, elements that are connected to your uh, missions or for your organizations. ICANN itself was mentioned several times this morning. Uh, civil society engagement uh, was also an element for several of the assessments or the lack of it or the need for improving it. And also uh, Mission, Mission Public, uh, which works a lot with the idea of governance, the issue of multi state governance was mentioned uh, several times uh, during the morning as well. So um, perhaps you could start uh, with some tweets to, to warm up the discussion, then we will open the floor to others that might have questions, comments, and observations. So first, Antoine, please, uh, for your initial tweets. And Antoine is have, have a parallel session of mission public. So Nigel, for your tweets then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nigel Hickson. I work for ICANN. Do you know what ICANN is? The Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. The, the words just uh, roll off the tongue, don't they? So ICANN, as you know, is, uh, has a responsibility in relation to the domain name uh, system. Uh, and as such, we're very concerned with uh, the domain net. We're very concerned at how the internet uh, develops. The internet obviously is, is, is integral to the domain name system. You can't have a domain name system that's interoperable, secure, and open if you don't have an internet that's open, secure, and singular. So ICANN is very concerned with the uh, future of the internet, that the internet remains an open place for collaboration, that everyone can reach everyone on the internet, that we don't have internet fragmentation, that we have openness, that we respect rights, that we have access, and of course we have a multi-stakeholder approach. ICANN, for those of you who know, and some of you will have been to uh, ICANN meetings, which are almost as confusing as the IGF and certainly have as many rooms as the uh, IGF. ICANN is a, a bottom-up organisation. We're a multi-stakeholder organisation uh, that develops policy uh, from, the, uh, from the grassroots. And as such, we're, we're delighted to be able to uh, support uh, UNESCO in this incredible work in terms of the internet uh, indicators, the universality indicators. And from what we've heard this morning, the, the benefit of those indicators in, in application in, in, in real terms in countries across the globe has, has been really felt. And we're, we're very, very pleased to be able to uh, understand the success that UNESCO has had. But of course, it's, it's ongoing. And the more countries that go through the process of looking at these indicators and seeing how they, uh, seeing how they, they measure up in, in, in different countries, the, the better. And of course, as, as far as I can be concerned, you know, the bottom-up multi-stakeholder approach, which is, is championed by many of the organizations here, and of course, which is a fundamental f feature of the, of the IGF, is paramount to that. So very happy to be here and support your excellent work. Thank you so much, Nigel. Uh, Sadaf is here in, on, in the room. So, if not, we can open, uh, not, uh, not necessarily only for questions and answers. If you have comments, uh, criticisms, suggestions, inputs, as, as, as Nigel just said, this is a work in progress and it's a collective work. So all the inputs you can offer, not only to UNESCO, but also to the teams that are applying the indicators in the different countries, I think they are more than welcome. So don't know if anyone wants to break the ice and start. Dorothy? Yes, it's been very interesting listening to all the country presentations. And in my capacity as the chair of IFAP, I see a lot of room for uh, sharing lessons learned. Um, so I want to throw that challenge to you, Siang Hong. I think even where we are today, there are some important lessons uh, that we can draw that are coming out. Uh, let's say they're being echoed by the different country experiences. Um, I would be very happy to debate within an IFAB Bureau meeting or council meeting 
some of those lessons learned along the lines of the IFAP working groups and even to inform the working groups of, of this progress. But I have a specific question for you uh, from CETIC. Um, all of us have noted this obsession with infrastructure and it's like if we build it, they will come. Not enough attention to content, especially multilingual content. Is there any policy recommendation that you have seen that has come out of your experience in Brazil that you could share with us? Because this is a common problem. I, I will also like to say that um, it is very clear that there are international governance issues that are not addressed by um, these indicators. For example, we heard that PIR is being sold by ISOC uh, for landfall gains. We don't know how ICANN is going to handle that. I had to say it before he left. But there are big issues which are global in their focus. For example, how ICANN is managed and what we pay for our domains uh, with the recent sale of .org. It will affect the national level. How is this accommodated within these indicators? Thank you. Thank you. So a specific question for Setik, but perhaps you can take note and let's see around the table or in the people in the room if they have more comments, questions, and then we do a final round later on. Please. Thank you so much for everybody. It was really interesting to hear about how other con countries also did their uh, assessments, especially those countries that have finished their assessments already. Um, my question was to all presenters, how long did it generally take to do the national assessment? Because it seems that the range of time is anything from three months to a year. I mean, what is on average the length of time that you needed in order to do the assessment? Thank you. So also question on length of time, Vice Minister, please. It's just regarding to the ICANN uh, intervention, uh, we already asked them about how we can improve our situation in Paraguay uh, um, because the domains are specifically in charge of uh, the academy as still as it started internet in Paraguay and now things have changed but this ha hasn't evolved. So we need help on how we can improve that. Thank you. More comments, questions, inputs? Here, please. Uh, um, uh, question. Um, especially in West Africa, where we have so many languages, how do you make sure you don't bring some few up to dominate the minority languages? Yeah. So a multilingualism question, very important. Thank you very much. Um, I am Florence from Kenya. We have a Kenyan delegation that has already presented. But uh, my issue is um, particularly on the digital divide. I think we appreciate that the internet has permeated every aspect of every person in this world, so that now it becomes a basic human right. My question and my uh, suggestion to UNESCO is uh, to do something particularly to narrow the digital divide. You notice that even in the rural areas, particularly in Kenya, uh, we are trying to do procurement online. But then we don't have in areas some electricity, we don't have the internet connectivity. And so if we make everything on the government processes digital, the question is how then does the farmer in the rural area access that? And so that can also go at the international level. You find the south and the north digital divide. The narrow is, the gap is just too huge. Thank you. Super, so a little bit the paradox between going with every process online and still having huge digital divides in, and gaps in, in many, many countries. Um, I see that Antoine from Mission Public has arrived and then we were mentioned before your arrival that uh, Mission Public uh, is working a lot in different processes of improving governance and as you know one of the key elements of those indicators are precisely a multi stake government governance environment for internet so perhaps you could give us uh, brief tweets 
on your impressions uh, on how these indicators can be useful for the work you are doing in, in the digital environment. Thank you very much. And um, so Antoine Vern with Mission Public. Uh, indeed, our work is um, we want to engage ordinary citizens into governance and that on global challenges um, like climate, uh, space, migration and internet. Why we want to do that is because we know that nowadays we have tools for governance and global governance that uh, date back to the 19th and 20th century and they are not up to the task when we talk about global challenges um, that, face, um, that humanity faces as, as a whole. And internet is a perfect example for that. Our stake is to then um, engage ordinary citizens and how we do that is by randomly selecting groups of citizens in their own country um, having them taking a day or two uh, of a face-to-face -face meeting, giving them balanced information on key topics like disinformation, like access, and uh, like the topics um, that are addressed by the Romix um, indicators, and then ask them to formulate recommendations and to give their opinion. So our goal is to have the, a structured process by which we gather the informed opinion of the people and we feed that back into the decision-making loop, so working with stakeholders. And that's the second very important part of all those processes, is working with a large coalition of stakeholders in order to understand what are the questions to ask and which kind of information we should uh, give to citizens in order for them to understand what they are going to talk about. Because, of course, if you ask someone on the street about internet governance or access, uh, this is going to be quite a bad answer that people are going to give. But on the contrary, if you give them keys about what that means, and if you give them time to discuss with other fellow citizens, um, then you can have something very constructive and qualitative. Uh, we've been starting that uh, project on the future of Internet two years ago, and um, in the first year we had qualitative discussion in 12 countries around the world, and we asked those group of citizens just what is Internet for you, and what do you wish as internet for the future? And that was for us a very good basis to build um, the agenda of this year and next year. This year we have worked in five countries around the world, and these are Japan, um, the Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh, so the, the biggest one, Cox's Bazaar, in Rwanda, um, in Brazil, and in Germany. And in each of those countries, we had a group of uh, 100 citizens, half men, half women, uh, with uh, all group ages and very different profession, um, and also people that are on the internet and people that are not on the internet. So also people that have no access to internet, and we ask them uh, to work on digital identity and disinformation, but also on the question of governance. And that is the, the relation to the Romix uh, indicators that um, by deploying such processes in the countries, at country level, you can get a very good um, sense of what the population um, wishes as priorities and how they feel the indicator, let's say, for themselves as citizens, so you have to interpret that, uh, but how they feel it is, um, um, or you say, um, fulfilled. An example, for example, on, on, um, on the question of uh, access, it was interesting to see that, that citizens in those five uh, workshops we have had this year um, feel, so they have a, a good understanding of the level of access they have on their own and of the level of access that is around the world. And that's, that was one of our findings. So we are just now uh, gathering the results because the last workshop was two weeks ago. So it's uh, very fresh. Um, but one thing is, um, so we asked them, for example, to, to try to, so first we asked them if they know how many people are connected in their country and all over the world. Um, and that they don't know, actually, when you, when you ask them. But then we worked with them on these information materials with those kind of numbers. And at the end of the day, of course, they know and they can react on that. So at the end of the day, we asked them um, the messages they wanted to send to IGF. And many of the messages were actually on access, all, even if that was not one of the topics of the day. So um, on that, we have a strong and also a strong difference between uh, Rwanda, uh, South Country, and North Country. So there, are, there is a lot of results, and I'm happy to share you with them. Thank you. So the issue of participation uh, and uh, how to engage more civil society, organized civil society, 
um, in general, but also citizenry uh, in, in particular. It's, it was raised many times this morning, so thank you for this, and I'm sure people will be interested in engaging in a conversation with you to understand more how this process is going. So to uh, give the opportunity for the people that were mentioned and others to reply, just a summary. Um, Dorothy underlined the importance of already un, uh, highlighting key lessons, and she already key lessons learned, and she already offered as part of the solution uh, EFAP as a venue and a place to discuss some of those lessons. So we can take that already that uh, commitment from this from this meeting. Uh, so specific questions on the implementation of the assessments, uh, time length for the different implementations, how to deal with multilingualism, how to work on, on the digital divide from one side and the more and more digital government initiatives from the other side. Um, and then there are some written questions that are also related to some of those topics. One question for UNESCO, how to improve the number of countries, how UNESCO is going to, uh, what the strategies of UNESCO to improve the numbers of countries using Internet Universality Indicators uh, to assess their own landscape. There is an interesting question if you that are already uh, publishing results, as is the case of Brazil, will uh, publish the data you collect in some sort of public platform so people can access the different indicators, not only the final publication. And uh, there is another question um, about, uh, that is a, also an interesting question on if governments are not involved in the process of applying the indicators, but later on many of the recommendations are towards governments, how to solve these in the cases that the governments are not very uh, in-depth involved in the process of application. So uh, these specific questions to UNESCO or to Kicknet, but I think it's our overall concerns for all the applications and could be addressed by those who want. So, David? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, we have now 12 minutes and 42 seconds. So, uh, perhaps, David, you should start. And then remember that for the brave ones who resisted until now, we still have a group photo. Otherwise, Chang Hong will have uh, problems of anxiety, and we don't want that. Uh, so, David, you have uh, the for, for a few minutes, and then Satik and others. Um, so, just to, just very quick. Firstly, on that question of digital by default, um, I mean, I would say something from my own country, which is an advanced industrial country, where the government has been trying to introduce many things digitally by default, so that it is in fact extremely difficult to access them if they're not digital. And that is frankly disastrous in terms of marginalization. It's clearly increased the marginalization of groups at the, that are already most marginalized within society who are unable to access uh, public services as they should uh, be able to do. And I think it is really important when thinking about is everything available online also um, thinking of that in terms of is everything available offline um, because otherwise people lose out. Just setting that aside as, as that's a kind of separate comment. Um, I think just as, as someone who is deeply involved in, in developing these uh, to come back on a few of the points. Um, obviously, what we're trying to do here is look at national internet environments and how to um, improve those national internet environments in terms of the, the Rome framework, Romex framework. Um, and so it's a it's sort of really in-depth look at the national context. And to some extent, that comes to the question of how long. Um, I think the answer to, ha to how long is as long as it takes, which is not very helpful, uh, but also do not rush it. Um, allow the space for the discussion that is necessary between the different stakeholder groups in order to get to conclusions that are more meaningful. Um, the risk is to do it, to try and do it too quickly and sort of tick off answers because it's easy. I think it needs the space uh, to make it work. And there isn't a fixed time for that. I think it's as long as it's going to take in your context. And I do think that government involvement is essential here um, uh, in order to make this work. It has to be it has to involve all stakeholders, and all stakeholders means including governments. Um, uh, and on the, uh, I mean, just in terms of overall impression from this, 
there are a lot more experiences than I had expected there to be by this time a year after they were agreed. Um, and I think the experiences are really interesting in that they've shown Firstly, how they've exposed where there are shortages of information in different countries and what people have done about that, um, because that's one thing I expected to come out of it and, and, and is a good thing to come out of it. And secondly, by the, the way in which actually the process has led to really thoughtful exchange of views in countries about what needs to be done, uh, all of which I think is really positive experience. And I, with, with, with our chair here, I, I agree. I think it's t we can actually, we are already in a position where we can assess how it's going and move forward from that, and that would be a good thing to do. Cetic. Thank you, Guilherme. Uh, very briefly, um, I agree when Doris mentioned that uh, the infrastructure dimension does not solve all the issues. So uh, in terms of uh, content, uh, in multilingualism, in Brazil, we don't have. Uh, this is an, not not a, a real issue, but instead of the tackling this uh, content issue, we are, of course, have a lot of data on the use and appropriation of ICTs and uh, uh, in different groups, social groups, uh, different regions uh, that we can identify. What are the gaps in terms of um, not only use but also digital skills? But uh, it is indeed uh, very important that we look at different dimensions beyond uh, infrastructure. Regarding uh, Tunisia's comments on the length or duration of this uh, field work, it all depends on how much structured you have the data production in place in a given country. In case of Brazil, we are lucky enough to have uh, very good ec ecosystems in terms of data production. Uh, CETIC is a major player in terms of ICT data and statistics, but also the National Statistical Office and the regulatory that provides the regular uh, data. So uh, it took us about three months to for the data collection process, but as uh, also David has mentioned, uh, it should take the necessary time so that we can really engage all the stakeholders, mainly government, civil society, academics, and private sector. Uh, otherwise, they will not feel the ownership of, ownership of the process. And as uh, somebody has mentioned, at the end of the day, we are going to give recommendations for the government. So if they don't take part in the whole process, they will not have the ownership. And last uh, comment by Paraguay in terms of uh, domain names. And uh, uh, Brazil has a very unique experience in terms of multi-stakeholder internet governance model. And this drives uh, the way that Brazilians, uh, citizens and Brazilian companies use the .br as a country code top level domain. Uh, today, we are the sixth largest uh, domain name uh, database in the world. 85% uh, of the companies in Brazil, they prefer using .com.br instead of the generic .com. This gives us a huge uh, domain name database that allow us to apply financial resources to cases like the Internet Universality Indicators that was fully financed by the .br domain names. So those are very briefly my comments for the questions. So any more people who wants to react there, please? We need to use the mic because it's a big room so we can... Uh, uh, hello, I'm Sumaya from United Nations University, uh, and we are conducting research basically for the UN system and for uh, state members. Uh, we would like to know if uh, the data are available on the on data sets uh, type and not only on uh, final reports. So I'm just recalling the question that was in the paper. Thank you. Well, um, the statistics that uh, were used in the report are all available at the micro data level if for those uh, willing to make different type of analysis. Uh, the qualitative uh, data 
are not available. We have to, to see how we can do that because we have interviewed uh, many uh, policymakers, uh, key actors from the industry. So we have tape, re we have uh, all the interviews are tape recorded. We also had focus groups that are all recorded and transcripted, but we have to see how we can provide access to the micro data, qualitative data. For the other statistics, uh, you can ask uh, Satik and we see how to provide the data, uh, access to the data. Thank you. So, since we are almost there, before uh, handing the floor over back to Chang Hong, which will probably make housekeeping and substantive announcements, uh, I will finish my moderation here just recalling you of one specific as aspect of the indicators we haven't touched here today, that is, it's, it's power beyond assessments. Of course, the purpose of this session was to discuss the different levels of assessments by different countries, but the tool itself is very useful for many other uh, objectives. You can use it for advocacy purposes, you can use this for raising discussions uh, on the internet development and the key characteristics that are expected from uh, UNESCO member states since this is a validated and endorsed tool. Uh, sometimes we concentrated too much in the assessment side, which is obviously very important, but please uh, be creative in the use of this tool. It's a publicly available tool you don't need to ask permission for UNESCO to use it uh, and our uh, if we can see in the long run many many different stakeholders making use of this tool in different ways it will be already a very big result for all of us involved in building it so thank you very much Thank you very much. What you just said is exactly one of strategy we can attract more country to, to convince more country to do this assessment. And we are creating an online platform, not only to showcase the final report at the publication, but also to be able to support sharing of the metadata, original data collection collected by different countries. That can be also very useful for the further sharing by, uh, the, the, the data for, for the countries. So uh, I, I don't think we have more time to tackle more questions. So let's do the picture. Okay, and um, my suggestion that we use this background, idea background, and uh, our people come to front, and uh, I suggest women in the front and the men behind, and <laughs> of course we can mix. Please, everybody here, let's do a nice picture as a good, uh, good memory. I also take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, all my colleagues here, and also all the speak here, speakers coming here, and all the audiences present to you now, and also our excellent technical support from the IGF Secretary, and also um, uh, thank you, Daniel. <laughs> he will also be our photographer. Okay, can we all stand um, like this? And um, yeah. we stand, we, we're facing outside, so we can have a picture with the background of the IGF. Oh, so, so where do you think, where we stand? We stand here or we stand there? Huh? Okay. Okay, I modify my suggestion. Let's go over there to, do you see Dorothy? Just go stand around her, please. Everybody moving a little bit. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, have you attended our indicator sessions? Okay. <laughs> okay, for those who have been present in our indicator session, to be factual, please let's go to the front.
Thank you. That one? Have a Oh, the she room was there and, and I entered and it was okay, no one I know. <laughs> it's not, this is not what I want to say. Hello, Miroslav Janko is from the OC mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Welcome so happy that, that you're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought that you were a woman. <laughs> Sorry, Miroslav. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to stay in touch. Yeah. And as Danilo said, we established the advisory board and we yeah. are expecting the research. Yes, yes, I will send you the thing. Okay. No, I, I'll be here for you Thursday. So, so if you want to have a bilateral meeting. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. <laughs>